Video is the most powerful communication tool available today, and capturing high-quality video has never been easier. In almost all cases, the raw video needs to be altered, trimmed, adjusted, or edited, and this is a major roadblock for a lot of people. This course is designed to get you up and running with one of the most popular video editing applications out there. Hi, my name is Dave Bodie for Tuts Plus, and in this course, you will learn the basics of editing in Adobe's Premiere Pro. You will learn how to organize your files outside of Premiere, how to import your assets, and how to set up a project. You will also learn some editing essentials, like marking the in and out points on clips, creating subclips, the basics of trimming in a timeline, adding cutaway shots, audio effects and video effects, adjusting the audio of your tracks, adding titles, and exporting your project. By the end of this course, you will have the skills you need to be able to take raw camera footage and turn that into something much more interesting. In the next lesson, you are going to learn about what you need to get started editing in Adobe Premiere Pro. In this lesson, you will learn what you need to get started editing in Premiere Pro. First, you're going to need to get Adobe Premiere Pro CC. Years ago, you could buy Premiere Pro as a standalone product, and it would be yours forever. Now, you have to use the Adobe Creative Cloud subscription-based payment model. Like it or not, it's here to stay. Getting Premiere Pro will run you about $20 USD per month, or if you want more apps, you can get everything Adobe makes for $50 USD per month. The upside of Premiere Pro CC is that it's frequently updated with new features and bug fixes. The next thing you will need is a computer to edit on. All of the new Adobe apps are 64-bit, so you will need a 64-bit operating system to run them. On PC, that means Windows 7 with Service Pack 1 64-bit or Windows 8 64-bit. On Mac, you need OS X 10.8, 10.9, or 10.10. For hardware, you're going to need a little bit of horsepower. You need an Intel Core 2 Duo or AMD Phenom 2 processor with 64-bit support on PC, and a multi-core Intel processor with 64-bit support on the Mac. 4 gigabytes of RAM is the minimum requirement, but 8 gigabytes is recommended. You need at least 4 gigabytes of space on your hard disk for installation, and a 7200 RPM or faster drive is recommended. A 1280 by 800 pixel resolution display is the bare minimum, but you're definitely going to want more space than that. On a Mac, there isn't a sound card requirement, but on a PC, you need a sound card with the ASIO protocol or the Microsoft Windows driver model, but I think you should be fine with just about any sound card on PC. You also need QuickTime 7.6.6 software and an internet connection. The internet connection is required for registration and for the software to make sure that you have paid your monthly fee. I believe there is a one month grace period if something gets goofed up with your payment, but after that, the software stops working. Finally, if you want to use any of the GPU accelerated features, and you definitely do, you're going to need an Adobe certified GPU card with at least one gigabyte of virtual RAM. Those are the basic requirements to get you going, but you will probably want more firepower at your disposal. CPU speeds will help with the real-time playback of your files and exporting your projects, so more cores and faster speeds will help. For RAM, more is always better. This is especially true if you are using Premiere with After Effects, Encore, Prelude, Media Encoder, or Photoshop simultaneously. All of these apps share the same memory pool, so if you have too little RAM, your performance will be crippled. If you want to use any of these apps at the same time, you probably want 16 gigabytes of RAM at the minimum. In my main workstation, I have 24 gigabytes of RAM, and in my backup workstation, I have 16. Three years ago, when I built my main workstation, the Intel i970 6-core CPU and 24 gigabytes of RAM was the most I could stuff into my computer without jumping up the cost by three or four times. It was the sweet spot for performance and price, so that's what I went with. Six months later, this was a different story, but that's how these things work. If you need a system for right now, it doesn't really matter what's coming down the pipe in a few months. For hard drives, it's probably best to have at least two. 
one for your operating system and apps, and the other to put your project files, media, preview files, and exports on. As you add additional drives, you can start moving things around to optimize your data flow. For example, if you had three drives, you might want to put your OS and apps on the first, media and project files on the second, and preview files, media cache, and exports on the third. This way, when you go to export your projects, you will be pulling the assets from one drive and writing the rendered video files to another, which will speed things up. SSDs are super fast and great to have, but you might want to reserve those for areas where you need the most speed, like your main OS drive and your media cache drive. If you can put your media assets on an SSD, that would be even faster, but video media is gigantic, and that isn't always an option. Just to give you an example, the media files for this course that you are watching right now are somewhere around 170 gigabytes. Once you get a few projects under your belt, the storage of your media assets starts to become an important thing to manage. If you edit video long enough, you're going to have to start juggling projects from internal to external storage, but this can be as simple as using a hard drive dock and a bunch of drives. To take advantage of some of the recent speed improvements in Premiere, you should also have a GPU that will work with Premiere's GPU accelerated features. They have a list of approved cards which covers a lot of popular cards, but some cards that are not on the list will also work. For example, I have an NVIDIA 970 GTX which isn't on the list and it works just fine. Like I mentioned earlier, the basic monitor requirement is super low, and you will probably want to have at least one 1920 by 1080 or higher monitor. Two or three monitors would be even better so that you can spread out your panels and have more space to work. You might also want to consider a monitor calibration tool as well. This is critical when you start doing color correction because you need to know that your monitor is showing you the proper colors, brightness, and contrast. A basic calibration device starts at around $100 USD, and if you have multiple monitors and you want them to match, look for a unit that has that feature as well. Another important aspect of editing is audio. It isn't listed anywhere in the requirements, but you should have a decent pair of audio monitors and headphones to use when you're editing. Making changes to the audio will require a higher level of speaker quality than you will get with your computer speakers. The PreSonus Aris E5 or the Yamaha HS5 is a good place to start with audio monitors. For headphones, you might want to check out the Sennheiser HD280 Pro, Sony MDR7506, or a super inexpensive option is the Monoprice 8323, which are shockingly good for the price. Whatever hardware you choose, I would recommend aiming for a little bit better than you think you might need. As cameras get better, you're going to need to deal with higher resolutions and higher bitrate codecs. These will put a lot more strain on your system, and a little extra firepower will go a long way to easing that transition. Now that you understand what you need to get started in Premiere Pro, you are ready to learn about file organization, which is coming up next. Before you start pulling your footage into Premiere, it would be smart to have your files organized first. This is a critical step with some camera systems, because if you get the folder structure wrong, your footage won't work properly. In this lesson, you will learn how to do some basic file organization. You're looking at a folder that contains assets for an instructional course that I'm putting together on how to shoot and produce an instructional video. And I wanted to show you this to just give you a general idea of what you might want to think about when you're organizing your files. I have a collection of different types of media in this folder here. You see I have some voiceovers, which are WAV files, and I recorded that in an application called Reaper. So there's a lot of Reaper backup files and a Reaper project file in here. I did some screen recordings, and so I have those uncompressed AVI files in a folder. I had some test photos that I shot. I have some docs and a few title graphics here that I threw in a folder just to keep it a little more organized. I have a folder with B-roll shots in here which I went through and changed the file names so that I could find them more easily if I want to use any of these shots in another project. Then I have all the footage files from the cameras that were used to shoot this project. Now, the main portion of this project is in this demo shoot folder here. And if I go into here, you can see I have it broken down by 
the type of camera that was shot. So a Canon 7D, a Canon C100, and a GoPro 4. And so you'll see I have my files in here. Most of these are video files, although I think I may have accidentally shot one photo with the lens cap on there. But I just throw everything right into the folder. Then I have a C100 folder, and there's two folders in here because I used two Canon C100s to shoot this project. And with some cameras, it's very important that you keep the folder structure exactly the same as how the camera originally created it. Because if you don't, importing those into your video editor can really screw things up. This Canon C100 is one of those cameras. So if I drill down into one of these folders, you'll see that there's many subfolders in here, and it has this kind of strange folder structure. The video files are actually in this streams folder here. But if I were to take the video files out of this folder and put them in a folder called Dave Cam C100, they would not import into Adobe Premiere properly because there are some other files in here which will tell Premiere that some of these files are actually a continuous recording, even though they're stored as separate files. This is something we're going to talk about more in an upcoming lesson, but I did want to go over it with you a little bit first. For example, I just stuck this card from my camera into my card reader, and when I open it up to view the files, you're going to see that same weird folder structure here. And all of the video files are in this streams folder. But when I'm taking this footage off of the card, what I do is grab this private folder and I put that inside another folder, just like I did with this other folder here. You can see I've organized it C100, Dave Cam, and then I put that entire folder right inside here. I did the same thing with this other camera here with Andrew Cam. You see it says private, AVC HD, and then the video files are actually down here in the streams folder. It's critical for the files that are shot with this Canon C100 and I think a lot of the other cameras that shoot to AVC HD format and possibly some other codecs that you keep the file structure and the folder structure intact right from the memory card. I'll just jump back here and show you. I have a GoPro folder here and I just threw all of the video files right from the card in this folder. I have some audio files that were recorded from an iPhone and all of that is part of this demo shoot here. So I have all of that organized accordingly. I have a few other folders here, conclusion and main teaching and introduction. These contain footage that's right from the card. So you'll see the same exact folder structure on here and all the video assets are right in the streams folder again. This is generally how I like to organize the projects that I shoot or the projects that I'm working on. Occasionally, if I have kind of general assets for projects, if I have music assets or photo assets, I'll put those in their own folder. So for example, I have a stock photos folder and inside here I have a bunch of stock photos. Most of them are photos that I have shot. And then I try and name the files in such a way that I can find them and use them. And then I can use them on several different projects. I do the same thing for audio. I have a big giant audio folder and in that folder I have sound effects, I have stock music, I have recordings that I've made and all kinds of stuff. And that's handy to have because that's not located in a project folder here with kind of project specific assets. So I can search those assets and use those assets on different projects and it's a little bit more convenient for me to work that way. So when I'm working on a project that has a lot of different assets from cameras and other sources, I like to put all of that into one big folder and get it organized in the way that makes the most sense to me. And that way, as soon as I get all of the assets from all the cameras and all the other sources, I can take my folder here and I can back that up to another drive. And that way, when I start editing, if something happens to the drive that I have the assets on, I have a backup with all the right folder structure and I have all the files located exactly where I need them so that it's a very seamless process to use the other drive and the project file that I'm working on to start editing right away. And there's no downtime. So make sure you're organizing your files and you're keeping things nice and tidy on your computer. And remember, if you're dealing with footage from a camera, you may need to keep the folder structure intact when you pull those files on your machine. Otherwise, they're not going to work properly once you get them inside of Adobe Premiere. So now that you have a basic understanding of how to organize your files, you're ready to go on to the next lesson where you're going to get a quick tour of Adobe Premiere Pro. I'm sure you want to get editing right away, but it would be good to learn about the general layout of Premiere Pro. This will help you follow along as you move through this course. So let's get started with the essentials. I just opened up Premiere Pro and by default, it starts with a little welcome 
pop-up here which shows you your recent items. It gives you an option to open project. You can create a new project. You can learn and get started or you can just exit the program. You also have a little tick box here to show the welcome at startup and you can turn that off if you want. I want to go over some of the interface elements with you and to do that you're going to need to open up the same project that I'm using and that's called Introduction to Video Editing in Adobe Premiere CC Quick Tour. I have it listed right here in my recent items because I've already had this project open but for you you're probably going to have to choose open and then navigate to wherever you have it located. So when you open up your project in Premiere Pro, it should look something like this. And if it doesn't, come up here to Window, Workspace, choose Editing, and then go to Window, Workspace, Reset Current Workspace. And what this will do is it'll reset the position of all the panels and all the windows so that it looks just like this. First, let's go over the menu. You see we have File, Edit, Clip, Sequence, Marker, Title, Window, and Help. A lot of these menu items and features in the menu are redundant and can be performed by pressing a button in Premiere's interface, using a keyboard shortcut, or with a different context menu in one of the panels. But the menu is a good resource to use if you're trying to do something in Premiere and you can't quite figure it out. You can kind of look through the menu and see if the action or the function you're looking for is in there. The window menu gives you access to all of the panels in Premiere's interface and you'll find that you'll need to go in here from time to time to make some of these panels visible. Now there's one thing specifically I wanted to draw your attention to in the menu and that's under Edit, Preferences, Autosave. This Preferences dialog contains all of the main preferences in Premiere that you may want to set. You have general appearance, audio, audio hardware, but really important, I think, is the autosave. Autosave, I think, is a really important preference to check on, and you can see that it's checked on right here, so that in case anything happens with your project, you won't lose your work. You can see I have it checked on right here. I have it set to automatically save every five minutes, and maximum project versions is set to 10. There's also an option to save backup project to Creative Cloud. If you are a Creative Cloud user, there may be a few more preferences that we check back with later in this course, but autosave is the only one that I'm really concerned with right now. You can see the main interface here is broken up into panels and panels are organized in the main application window in an arrangement called a workspace which you saw in the beginning of this lesson where I came in and I made sure it was set to editing and then I reset the current workspace. There are a few preset workspaces, which is basically an arrangement of these windows. There's assembly, audio, color correction. I created these two, dual monitor and edit with reference monitor. And once you arrange the windows how you like, if you want to save that, it's pretty easy to do. You just select new workspace and then you name it and then it'll be available to you right up here anytime you want to use that particular workspace. I have one that's specifically set for using dual monitors and what that does is it takes some of the windows and it pushes those out to a second monitor so I can maximize my workspace. Now like I mentioned the workspace is customizable so these panels are all repositionable and the other panels will resize to fit the workspace. You can see we can make any of these bigger or smaller just by grabbing and dragging in between the panels. You can also take the panels and move them around. So if I click up here and drag and I pull this over here, you can see I'm getting these little purple indicators here and that's letting me know that I can dock this window in all of these locations. So if I put the window over here, now this big frame up here contains a bunch of tabs and the program monitor, which is the panel that I just moved, is now sharing this frame with metadata, audio clip mixer, effect controls, and the source monitor. I can also dock it to the side. You can see there's little trapezoids here. And what that will do is kind of split the frame into two. So now I have a frame over here where I can pull things in and I can create tabs over here. 
or I can dock this wherever I would like. You can also take and just drag outside the application window, just like I just did there. It just went off the screen a little bit, but that will make a new window for you as well. So if you are using dual monitors or even triple monitors or quadruple monitors, you can drag these panels and then you can pull in other panels and create your own workspace to fill up all your monitor space. I'll just reset this here. And again, if I really screwed this up, you know, and I, and I really messed up the look of this and I wanted to get back to that default, super easy. I just reset the current workspace and it goes right back to this default. Now, like I mentioned before, there are context menus in each one of these panels. Each panel will have a little menu here for closing the panel, closing the panel group and so on. But if you right click in the panel, it'll bring up a menu with all kinds of different features. Additionally, there's also a little wrench icon here, which also has menu items as well. Now, as you see, as I click around the interface, the panel that I'm currently selecting is highlighted blue. And this is important because some of the menu items up here are not available if you have the wrong panel selected. You see, I don't have anything available in the clip menu here because I don't have a clip selected. I'm currently selected on this tools panel here. And so I don't have any of these menu items. So it is important that you select the right window and also you have the right item selected. So even if I'm in the timeline panel here, if I don't have a clip selected, I still don't have any options here in the clip menu. I do have options here when I'm in the sequence window, but if I'm over here in the info window, I can't access my sequence settings because I don't have a sequence selected. As soon as I select something like the program monitor, now the program monitor is displaying the current sequence that I'm working on. And now I can go in and find my sequence settings. So let's go over some of the panels that you're going to be using the most. The program monitor is a panel that plays back the sequence of clips that you are assembling. So basically the program monitor is the display of your timeline panel or the sequence that you are currently working on. Down here, this is the timeline panel, and this is where you work on your sequences. This panel right here is called the source monitor. And this plays back individual clips and you can use the source monitor to prepare your clips before you add them to your sequence in the timeline window here. Down here, let me make a little bit of space. This is the project panel. You can see it says right here project and then it gives you the name of this project. The project panel contains all of the assets you're going to use for your project and it's where you can organize those assets so that they are easy to find. Way over here is the audio level meter panel. And this duplicates the display of the audio track mixers master meters. That was a lot of words right there. So basically this is an audio meter. And if I play this clip here. Because we're making larger cookies, you'll want to take the low and slow approach. This is not showing me the meter of this track. It's showing me the master meter. Now, another panel that you're going to use quite often is right up here, and that's the effects controls panel. Right now, you don't see anything in here until I select a clip. And now you can see I have some parameters here that I can adjust. Now, I haven't added any effects on this clip, but there are a few default parameters here. If I add an effect to this from the effects panel, you will see the effects listed here, and you can change the parameters of those effects. And if I did want to add an effect to this, what I would do is come down to this frame right here. And you see, I have this little scroll bar right at the top there, because this frame isn't big enough to display all of these panels or all of these tabs. And if I click right here, you will see the effects panel. Now the effects panel contains all of the audio and the video effects contained in Premiere. It's where you'll find all of the basic native effects that ship with Premiere Pro. And there are quite a few. And it's also where you'll find any third party effects, which you may buy for Premiere Pro. Now let me go over some of the other panels here that are brought up by default. You have your media browser panel here, and this is a way that you can navigate your computer file system and pull in and import your clips and other assets into Premiere. 
This is going to become important in an upcoming lesson when we look at specific file types for certain camera systems. You have your info panel here, and if I click on this clip, you can see some info listed about this clip. There's a markers panel here, so if I drop a marker in here, I can add some notes about this marker right here. And then there's the history panel, and this shows you what you've done so far in your project. If I jump up to this frame up here, you have an audio clip mixer, and this is a way that you can change the audio levels for individual clips. And then there is the metadata panel up here, which you can see all the metadata listed for this clip. There's certainly a lot more to know about these interfaces and menus, but this is the basic information that you need to know in order to move on with this course. In the next chapter of the course, you're going to learn about setting up a project. And that's going to start with importing assets. So check that out coming up next. The first step in editing is getting your footage and other assets imported into Premiere. In this video, you will learn a few ways to get it done. So let's start by going up to File, New, Project. So we can start fresh. And we'll call this Cheryl Cookie Instructional. Now, when you are creating a new project, you will see you'll have a lot of options here, location where you want this project to be saved. And this is just the project file, not the assets that you are going to import into your project. These other options you can pretty much leave at their defaults and then press OK. So let's look at how to import assets into Premiere. And we can do this in a few ways. If we jump over to the project panel here, you can see that it says import media to start. And if you double click right in here, it brings up a window here, and then I can navigate to where I have the assets for this particular project located. And for you, you're going to be looking for a downloaded folder called Cheryl Cookie Instructional Assets. For me, that's located on my X drive under a folder called Cheryl Cookie Instructional. And then here I have my Cheryl Cookie Instructional Assets. If I go into this folder, I have two subfolders. One is called Wide. And here I have a collection of the wide shots that we're going to be working on. And then I have another folder called Cutaway, which has the collection of the cutaway shots that we'll be using as well. So I can select individual files to import. I can select a single file here. I can lasso several files and import them all. And I can also import a folder. You can see there's an import folder option right down here. So I can actually back up and choose this folder, which contains the two subfolders in it, and then import this folder into Premiere. And now I have a representation of that same file structure in Premiere, which is a really handy way to go about importing your assets. Now I don't have to do as much organization inside of Premiere. And you can see if I drill down in these folders, I have all the files that I need exactly how I organize them. Now, additionally, you can also just drag files right into Premiere. So if I wanted to grab an additional file, I could do that. I could search for a file here. I'm going to look for an arrow graphic that I created, and I could take that and just drag that right into Premiere. And if I jump back to Premiere, because this is a Photoshop file, it's going to ask me if I want to import this merging all the layers together, or I have some other options here. I'm just going to choose Merge Layers. And now I have that asset in here as well. So you can drag items into the project panel. You can also drag items into a sequence once you've created one. So this way of importing files works well for a lot of different files, for graphics, for audio, for some video clips if they're shorter. For some camera systems though, particularly cameras that shoot in an AVHD format, they store the files in a file structure, which we looked at in a previous lesson. And importing those raw files will not get you the result that you're looking for. So let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. This is a folder of a concert that I shot, and you'll see there are 10 files in here. But I actually only pressed the record button once and I let it run for, I don't know, two hours or so. You see, as I click around on these clips, they all say they're about 11 minutes, 12 seconds long. And that's really not how I want to use these clips because if I import these into Premiere by just dragging them into Premiere, there's going to be a very small break 
in between these clips when I put these on a sequence, and that's going to break the flow. It basically drops a frame and the audio gets kind of glitched out a little bit. So this is not the way you want to import these MTS files into Premiere. What you want to do instead is go over here to the media browser and navigate to where those files are stored. As you can see, if I jump into my Jonathan Stills folder, and I go to my HFL concert, and I go into the wide shot folder, and then I click on private, I don't even get those other folders because Premiere knows that what it's really looking for is the streams folder. And you see there's only two files listed. But if I look back in here, this is the same exact location. There's actually 10 files in here. So Premiere is showing you that it knows that at the start of this file here, 00001, this is one file and all of the rest of those between 00001 and 00009, those are all one continuous clip. And so when I right click and I choose import, this file will import into Premiere perfectly and there won't be any breaks in between any of those files. And this is how you want to import the files. If you have MTS files that were shot on a camera that records to AVHD format. And I believe there's a few other cameras that record with a similar file structure. When I'm working with footage from one of these cameras that stores the file in this particular file structure that I need to leave intact, the way to do that is you go into the media browser in Premiere, you navigate to the files, and then you can select the files, you right click, and then you can choose import. If I just import this one file in here, it will show up as one clip, and you can see the media duration is one hour, 39 minutes, 20 seconds, and zero frames. And that's exactly what you want. Now, other files that have come from a DSLR or other camera systems that shoot to different file types, you can pretty much just organize those files however you like, and then import them into Premiere. But again, cameras that shoot to AVHD format that store the files in that particular file structure need to be imported this way into Premiere. Otherwise, you're gonna have just a whole bunch of headaches. Now, because importing files has to do with where files are located and getting them inside of Premiere, I wanted to touch on one other point really quick, and that is what happens if you have a project and you've saved it, and then you move the files to a different location. Well, thankfully, Premiere is pretty darn smart. And if I save this file, and then I close Premiere, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to navigate back to my folder here. I'm gonna go into the Cheryl Cookie Instructional Assets, and I'll just take one of those files, and I will cut, and then I'll paste it somewhere else. So I'm gonna go back, and I'll just paste it in here. So this is just going to represent what happens if you move some of your files. If I open Premiere back up, and I open that last project, Premiere is going to start loading those assets, and it's gonna come up and say, hey, one or more of your files is not where it was before. And it brings up this link media dialog box and it says missing media for these clips. And we see the clip name and the file name because those are separate, which we'll look at later, and the file path where it was looking for it. You see that? X Drive, X Video Projects, Cheryl Cookie, Instructional, Cheryl Cookie, Instructional Assets, and it was in the wide folder. So I can just tell it that this file is offline, I can cancel, or what you probably wanna do is locate. And locate brings up another window here where you can search for the file, or if you know where you moved it, you can just tell Premiere, look in this file. Now to make it easier, there's an option right down here to display only exact name matches. And this means that it won't show you any other files except for files that have the exact same name as the file that Premiere is currently looking for. So if I check that box, then I can just jump to the folder where I know that the new file is, and it's right here, and it's displaying that. Then I select that, and I choose OK. And now when I open up my project, that file is going to be in here, and everything's going to be all set. Now let's say you moved a whole bunch of files. Well, Premiere is smart enough to know that when it finds one file in that folder, and it sees all the other files associated with that project, it will link them automatically. So you do not have to do this to every file. 
if you point it to the location where just one of those files is, Premiere will find all of those other files and it will relink everything so your project works correctly. It's a fantastic feature and I use it all the time when I have to kind of reorganize things or add or move files to another drive. It does not ruin your project and it's very easy to get things up and running again when you move around your files. You do need to be careful when you're moving around video files that need to remain in that particular folder structure like those MTS files. So that probably means that you have to take the files and the folder structure exactly how it came off the camera and then move that entire folder structure or whatever the top folder is and then move that somewhere else. That will work. But for example, if you move those .mts files out of that last folder, out of the streams folder, and you move those somewhere else, Premiere's going to have a really difficult time figuring that out. It probably won't work correctly. So make sure you keep those files in that folder structure and move the top level folder when you're moving those around. In the next lesson, you're going to learn how to do some basic organization inside of Premiere to keep your projects running smoothly. So check that out coming up next. Organizing your files outside of Premiere is smart, but keeping things organized inside of Premiere is critical. In this lesson, you will learn how to organize your files inside of Premiere. So organizing your assets and your files inside of Premiere is pretty simple, and you can choose how much organization you want to use depending on the complexity of your project. If you have a project that only has three or four assets, you may not need to make a whole bunch of folders and change label colors and rename your clips. But as your projects become more complicated, it's going to really help to keep things organized. One of the easiest ways to keep your project organized is to use bins. Now bins are basically video editing jargon for folders. You see, they even look like a folder icon. And this is going to be very similar to how you keep your folders organized or how I hope you keep your folders organized outside of Premiere. You can see that when I imported these files right here, Premiere preserved the folder structure for me and these files are organized exactly like I had them organized outside of Premiere, which is very handy. When you're importing things from the media browser, that doesn't always happen. If you have to go in and grab those MTS files like we talked about, they are not going to come in in that folder structure. They're just going to be imported into the project panel as files. Now, if you have a particular folder selected, if I create a new folder here and I call this C100, and I go to the media browser, and I select a folder that has some footage from my Canon C100, so I go in here, C100, there's that private folder. If I double click on that, I can see some MTS files. So if I just import one, because I had the C100 folder selected, it's going to put this MTS file in that C100 folder. Otherwise, if I had nothing selected and I went and imported that file, it's not going to put that MTS file in a folder. Now this can get very confusing when you have multiple shots from multiple cameras and you have the same exact file names. So if I was shooting with two Canon C100s, they would both have the first files listed as 00000.mts. And that could get very confusing. So, so making folders and putting those files into folders is a very easy way to keep your projects organized. I'm just going to undo that last import because I don't need two versions of that file in there. Oftentimes, if I have more than one folder with video assets in them, I will create, I will create another folder called something like footage, and then I'll take these folders and put them inside the footage folder. And that way, when I collapse everything down, it's much neater and it's much tidier, and everything is nice and organized. I also like to create folders for other types of media. So another way you can create a folder is to just drag the files right onto the new bin button. So I might call this still or stills, and then because this is a graphic element, I may drag this into another bin here and call this graphics. In that way, if I were to say grab a few photos, I could import these. And when I do, I'm going to drop them right into the stills folder. And then I can take these and select them, drag those to a new bin and I'll call this photos. So now I'm really starting to get things organized really nicely in my project. If I have any audio assets, I like to put those in their own folder. So I'll make an audio folder. If I have any titles, I usually create a folder for all the titles. If I have 
more than one sequence, I will create a sequence and I'll usually create another folder called mats. And inside the mats folder, I will put color mats. And inside the mats folder, I usually will put some different color mats. So if I right click over here, I can choose new item and then choose color mat, which is almost off the screen here. I can also do it up here, file, new, color mat, and I can select my settings here. I'm just gonna click okay. And then maybe I'll just make a white mat. So I'll, I'll label this mat. And I'll put that white mat in my mats folder. And for me, using these bins really helps to keep my projects organized. Now, another way you can keep your project organized is by renaming your assets. If I look in my footage folder and I go down in the Cheryl Cookie Instructional Assets, you'll see that all of these clips here are already named. And that's because these are not the original files from the camera. So to make the files a little bit easier to work with, what I did is I took the raw camera files and then I edited some shorter clips from them so that we would have something to work with in this course. When I exported those files, I went ahead and named them appropriately so that we could keep track of what files we were using. Normally, you're going to be working with raw camera files and they're not gonna have these nice names. They're gonna have, you know, the strange manufacturer names like 00000.mts or mvi underscore 1957.mov. Just like you find with this file right here. But the problem is when you get a bunch of these files, it can be hard to know which of the files contain what footage. So one of the ways that you can make that a little bit easier is just to rename the items or the assets in your project. I'm gonna double click on this clip and I can see that this file here is a shot of a table with some photo stuff on it. So if I wanna keep this organized, what I would do is click on the clip and then click over here on the name and now I can rename this. So I may rename this clip table with photo stuff underscore 00000.mts. Alternatively, I could just name this table with photo stuff, and that's fine too. That's not going to affect the actual file. In fact, if I wanted to find where this file was located, what I could do is right click on it, and then right up here, there's an option to reveal in Explorer. And when I do, it's going to pull that file up, and I see it's right here. So renaming the clips and renaming the assets in your project is a great way to keep things organized. This also helps with photos as well. You can see I have three photos that I imported here that are named 7D photo underscore IMG underscore 4946.jpg. Not super helpful. So I could rename this to something like men's shoes, gray background. I could say this is men's shoes, blue background. And finally, I could say that this is men's shoe profile. And this will make it much easier to navigate my project, especially when it comes to searching for files. Now you see there is a search box up here. So if I wanted to find some of the footage that has eggs in it, because I named those clips, I can just type eggs right up here. And now I can see these two clips are labeled adding the eggs. If I want to find uh, some of the shoes, just type in shoe, and now I can find those files. So very easy to find files, and it works especially well if you go ahead and rename your clips. Another way you can help keep your project organized is to change the color of the labels. So you can see if I go back into this footage folder here, and I open up these two folders, you can see I have a bunch of clips that are under the wide bin here and a bunch of clips that are under the cutaway bin. And over here, all of these are labeled blue. Well, when I'm editing, to make it easier for my eye, I could select these files and I can right click over here and change the label color to something like violet. Now when these appear on the timeline, they will be violet and they'll be easier to distinguish with the cutaway shots. So using bins, renaming your clips so you can find them easily and search for them and changing your label colors are three very easy and basic ways to keep your projects organized. In the next lesson, you're gonna learn how to create a sequence and add your assets. In this lesson, you will learn how to create a sequence and add your assets. 
All right, to start off here, I'm going to get rid of some of these extra bins that I created. I'm just going to select them and then delete them. I'm going to delete this audio bin here. I'm going to grab the Cheryl Cookie Instructional Assets and pull that out of the footage bin here and then delete the footage bin. And now I have the same assets as what you have here. So I have the Cheryl Cookie Instructional Assets and then the wide bin and the cutaway bin. So let's look at creating a sequence. A sequence is a collection of all your video, audio, photo, graphic, and title assets, and that's built in the timeline panel. But as you see, it says timeline, no sequences. That's because this project doesn't have a sequence yet. So you can create a sequence in a few different ways. The easiest way is to just drop a media clip right into the timeline panel. So if I just grab a wide shot here, let me go down to the intro. If I just drag that right over here, this will create a sequence. And you can see over in the project panel here, I have a new item, and this is a sequence. Now I should tell you that when you're dragging clips from the project panel, you need to make sure you're grabbing right over the icon here. If you grab right here, sometimes you can accidentally click and it'll select the text as if you were going to rename the clip. So make sure you're grabbing right on the icon. So if I come over here to the timeline window, I can zoom out here and you can see what we have going on. Now we have a sequence to work with. You can see we have our clip here. We have our time ruler here, which is showing us hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. And time goes from left to right here. And then we have some video tracks and some audio tracks here. Now every sequence is going to have at least one video track and any sequence with audio is going to have at least one audio track. By default, when you create a new sequence, it'll oftentimes put more video tracks and audio tracks in the sequence so that they're kind of pre-made and ready to be used. But dragging clips over to the timeline window is not the only way you can make a sequence. You can also take any one of these clips. Let me grab a different one so we have a different name. So I'm gonna grab this, bring it right over here to the new item button, and you can see I have a new sequence. You can also right click in the blank space here and choose new item sequence. And this will bring up the new sequence window. Let me just cancel out of this because you can also do that right down here, new item sequence. I'm gonna cancel and you can also do that up here, file new, where is it? Sequence, which has also got the keyboard shortcut control N. And you can see in this window here, we have a number of different presets. So I could select this preset here, and you can see in this description panel over here, it tells me I'm going to have three video tracks and I'm going to have several audio tracks. It says three standard audio tracks, and then it's going to give me three 5.1 audio tracks. That's not really something that I'm super interested in having. You can also go over here and modify some of those sequence settings as well, and what types of tracks you want over here in the tracks tab. And then you can save your presets down here. But the easiest way again is to just drag one of your media clips to this new item button and that will create a new sequence. And when you do that, this sequence is created with the right frame size. So you can see it's 1920 by 1080. It's the right time base. So this is 23.976 frames per second, which is correct. It's the right pixel aspect ratio, which is one. It has the right audio sample rate and everything's set up properly. So I'm going to get rid of this sequence here. I'm going to select it over here and just delete it. And then I'm going to take this sequence right here, CCI intro wide, and I'm going to pull it out of the Cheryl Cookie Instructional Assets bins. And I'm going to put it in its own bin called sequence. Now to add other assets to this, it's very, very easy. And that can also be done in a number of ways. So you can take anything from the project panel and just click and drag that right over in your sequence. You can see as you're dragging it, there are some lines that show up when you get to the edge of other media clips. And so this clip right here will snap to the edges of other media clips because snapping is turned on. Snapping is right here. It's also S on the keyboard. Items will also snap to the playhead. 
you can see right there. And so it's very easy to just pull things in from your project panel right into your sequence. I'm just gonna select these guys here and delete them. I can also add multiple clips to my sequence at the same time. So I can select a clip over here in the project panel and then shift click down here and then just drag these over to my sequence. I'm gonna lasso those and get rid of them. You can also control click and bring those in as well. If I hold the control key down and I double click into this wide bin here, that's going to go in to this wide bin. You can see in the project panel now it says bin wide. And then right here, I can go back up a level. So if I go into the wide bin and I change the view to icon view, now we have even more control over how we can add these clips to the sequence. I'm just gonna move this up a little bit so I can have just a little bit more room to work. Now I can take this intro clip and I can move this to the beginning here. So now I have the intro clip first. Then I could take something like preheat oven and I could bring that up as second and then maybe butter melt instructions and I'll put that third. Now I can take these three clips, control click them and then pull them in and now they'll be added in the correct order, which is very cool. Now, when you're in icon view, you have some sort options, which you can find right down here. And currently it's set to user order, but there are other ways that you can sort this folder. For example, if I change this to name, now you're going to see that these are going to go in alphabetical order. Usually I like to have this set to user order, and that way I can jump into the icon view and I can reorder things and then add them to the project. I'm just gonna select these and delete them. So I'm gonna go up a level and then up another level. So I'm back to my project base level here. I'm gonna click list view because that's how I prefer to look at this panel. And now if I double click on one of these bins, it'll pull up this bin in its own window. And now I can take this bin and I could dock it right here. So if I wanted to have the wide bin open so that I could see what's going on, I could have that right there very conveniently and I wouldn't have to keep navigating in and out of these folders. I could just create a tab here. I could do the same thing for the cutaway. I'll double click that. This time it shows up in list view, but I can change that to icon view. And then I can pull that right alongside my bin wide here. And now if I wanna quickly get a visual idea of what these shots look like, I could jump over to these tabs here. Now there are a couple of other ways to add clips to your sequence. One of those is right from the source monitor. So if I double click on a clip, it's going to pull it up in the source monitor here. And from the source monitor, I can click anywhere inside this picture and then pull that down into the sequence. And that will add this clip to the sequence. I can also drag just the video by hovering over this little film strip icon right here. So I can click and drag and now I can just add the video portion of this clip. I can do the same thing with the audio. I'm just gonna select those and delete those. So you can use the source monitor for adding clips to your sequence as well. I'm gonna jump back over here to this wide bin here. There's an additional way to add clips to the sequence when you select multiple clips. There's a button right down here, it's called automate to sequence. And when you click this, you get some options. You can see we can select the order and we can use the sort order or the selection order. And then we have several more options here. We can apply default audio transitions. We can apply default video transitions. And so we can have these added as well. If I zoom up on the timeline, you can see I have audio transitions and video transitions. So it's just another tool that you can use to add clips to your sequences. You can do the same thing over here in the list view. I'm back to the project panel here. So I can select these guys here. I can click automate to sequence, and then I can choose selection order or sort order. So if I wanted to add these in a particular order, I could say selection order, and then I could add them to the sequence that way as well. So there are many ways that you can add clips to your sequence, and it's very, very easy to do. In the next lesson, you're gonna learn how to mark the in and out points in your clips
to make editing in the timeline much faster. In this lesson, you will learn how to mark the in and out point of individual clips. This will really help speed up your workflow when you're editing in the timeline. So as you learned from the previous lesson, you can add clips from the project panel or the source monitor right into your sequences. And when we did that, we added the entire clip. And I know that because if I look at this clip right here and I zoom up on it here, I can see that there is a little white triangle here at the beginning and the end of this clip. And these triangles indicate the very beginning and the very end of this entire media clip. But often, you're not going to want to add an entire clip, especially if you're working with raw camera files, because usually you'll have a little bit of noise or a little bit of camera motion before the part that you actually want to include in your sequence. And so adding the entire clip to the sequence and then editing those beginning and end bits out is not the best workflow, especially if you have a bunch of other items in the sequence. A better way to do it is to define the in and the out points of individual clips before you add them to your sequence. And this is called marking. So if I jump back here to the project panel and I double click on the intro, that's going to open up here in the source monitor. Now if I move the playhead all the way back to the beginning and I hit the space bar on my keyboard to play this clip, you'll get an idea of what this looks like. I mixed up that one, sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay. Have you ever had a recipe for chocolate chip cookies that left something to be desired? It can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe. So you can see there was some stuff before Cheryl started talking that I really don't want to include in my edit. But if I pull in the entire clip, I have to then go in here and start making those changes, which is a little bit too much work. It's not the best workflow. So instead, I'm going to mark the in and the out point. And I can do that in a few different ways. Right down here, there's a mark in button and there's a mark out button. So I can play. Thank you. Okay. Until right before Cheryl starts talking, which is right here. And then I can click the mark in button. I can also use I on the keyboard as the shortcut. And then I can go to where she's done talking and then mark the out point. Have you ever had a recipe for... So I'll just scrub along here. So it's right about here is where Cheryl stops talking. Bakery style cookies. Ziegler, and I'm going to show you in this video how to make big bakery style cookies. I've so right about here, I'll mark an out point. And when I do that, you can see that now there is this in out point selection, which is showing me where I've marked the in and the out point in this entire clip. Now, if I were to make a little space in my sequence here, and pull this clip in, you can see that this media clip is much shorter. This is the same exact clip as right here. These are both the CCI intro wide clips. But this clip is only the part that I really want. And this makes editing a lot easier because now I don't really have to pull in a lot of junk that I don't need into my sequence. I can streamline that and I can pull in just the stuff that I really need. And so let's try this with another clip. I'm going to double click on adding the vanilla and that's going to bring that up in the source monitor here. And you can see that it says that right here, source CCI adding the vanilla underscore wide. So if I play this, okay. and action with the vanilla. we're going to measure one tablespoon. You can see right about there is where I want to mark the in point. So I want to back the playhead up a little bit and then play it again. We're going to measure. I'm going to go back a little farther. So, Right about here, I'm going to mark an endpoint. And this time I'm going to do it with a keyboard shortcut, which is I. And then I'm going to play to the end. We're going to measure one tablespoon of vanilla. Usually recipes call for a teaspoon, but you'll get a really great flavor by using triple that and a tablespoon for this recipe. Wow. So I'm just going to stop playback with the space bar and then I'm going to press O on the keyboard and that's going to mark the out point. Now you don't have to get really specific with the in and the out points in the source monitor. This is more of a higher level marking of the in and the out point. And then you can get into the refining of the actual edit points once it's in your sequence. And then you can see how well it flows from the previous clip and trim up the beginning and the end to make it really nice. But this is the process you want to do before you add this to your sequences. Now, you can also do this 
in this thumbnail view here. If I select one of these clips, and this time I selected adding the vanilla, you can actually see that the in and out points are already marked and highlighted by this blue line here, which makes it really easy. But if I select another clip here, I can hit play, and it'll play right down here. I'll make this a little bit bigger so you can see. And I can mark in and out points right from the project panel as well. So I can select this clip. And right from here, I can just hit I. Scrub to the end. And then hit O. And if I double click, it'll bring it up in the source monitor. And you can see I've done the same exact thing right here. I've marked my in and my out points. So it's another way that you can do it. It works really well for quickly marking in and out points because you can do it right here. You don't have to bring it up in the source monitor. It also gives you a way to view where those in and out points are without bringing it up to the source monitor, which is pretty cool. So that's how you mark your in and out points. And then when you bring them into your sequence, they're all trimmed up for you and they're much easier to work with. In the next lesson, you're going to go one step further with this idea and learn how to create subclips from a longer clip. Sometimes you will need to make several shorter clips from one longer clip. The best way to do this is by making subclips, and in this lesson, you will learn how it's done. Sometimes you run into a situation where you will have a really long clip, and there will be several elements that you want to pull out from that clip and use in your sequence. Let's jump into this cutaway bin here and double click on the microwave cutaway clip. So this is a pretty long clip here, and it shows several things if we scrub through. You can see there's some opening and shutting of the microwave, and there's two elements that I want out of here. There's the putting the butter into the microwave, which happens right here, and then there's a close-up shot of Cheryl dialing in 30 seconds on the microwave. So if I wanted to use this two separate times as two separate clips, I could mark an in and out point here, add that to my sequence, and then go back and add another in and out point, and then add that to my sequence, or I could make a few subclips. So to do that, I'm going to find the first part of this clip that I want to make into a subclip, which is right here. So I'm going to get Cheryl opening the door right here. So let me back this up a little bit. I'm going to set an in point here. And then I'm going to play this. Okay, right here. I'm going to make an out point here. And then what I'm going to do is hold control and then pull this down into my project. And that's going to bring up this make subclip window here. And now I can rename this. I can leave the main part of the clip named the same, and then I can say butter in or something. And then I have an option to restrict trims to subclip boundaries. I'm going to uncheck this and then click OK. And then you can see it's listed down here as a different icon. And then I will do the same thing. I will scrub along here and find the endpoint which is right about here, set an endpoint, and then I will select an outpoint somewhere in this neighborhood. I can also make a subclip from this by coming up here to the menu and choosing make subclip, or I can use the keyboard shortcut control U. So with this selected, I will hit control U. It's going to bring this up. I will rename this enter 30. And this time, I will check the box Restrict Trims to Subclip Boundaries. Now, when I pull these into my project, you can see that they're much shorter. And in the project panel here, I have them labeled in a very convenient way so that I can find them later if I need to. I'm going to move the playhead over these two clips, and then I'm going to zoom up on them by holding down Alt and scrolling with the mouse wheel. Now there were two options that I selected when I made those subclips. The second one, I chose to restrict trims to subclip boundaries. And what that does is 
it makes it so this clip, I am no longer able to extend the length of this little sub clip here. You can see I have those little white triangles at the beginning and the end of this clip, meaning that I can't make this longer than what I have right here. Even though this clip is actually longer, you can see that right up here. This is that clip that I just made. And this original clip is much longer than this, but because I chose restrict trims to sub clip boundaries, when I pull that into my sequence, I can no longer make this any longer. I don't really like that. So I'm gonna take this and delete it. You can see on this other sub clip here, this just shows up like any other clip that I marked an in and out point for. So I can take this and I can pull out the ends of this to make this longer if I want to, and I'm not restricted by that option. So I could take this guy right here in the project panel and delete it, come up here to the source monitor, hit control U again. This time I'm going to uncheck restrict trims to subclip boundaries, name that enter 30, pull that back into the cutaways folder because somehow that got moved up. And now when I add this to the project, you can see that I don't have those restrictions on the beginning and the end of this subclip. Now let me go back and I'll undo this just for a second. Now, if you do for whatever reason, like that option to restrict the trims to the subclip boundaries, you can edit it afterwards. You can come over here to the project panel, right click, and then just off the screen here, there's an option to edit subclip. And now what I can do is I can change the in and the out point here of this subclip. Now I can't go longer than the original clip's duration, but I can change the in and out point. So I could scrub this back a little bit and it'll show you that now the start has shifted negative two seconds and seven frames. I could make the end point a little bit longer and I can also take off this restriction that restricts the trims to subclip boundaries. And you can see what it's done there. It's made this clip longer and it's also removed that restriction. So you do have options either way, but making subclips is another valuable tool in speeding up your workflow because now if I want to add this butter going into the microwave shot throughout this edit for whatever reason, and I'm not saying that you should or you need to in this particular edit, but you definitely will find uses for making subclips. Now it's searchable in my project panel and now I have it ready to go and already clipped out so I don't have to keep coming back to this microwave cutaway clip in trimming out little parts that I want to use. And you can imagine if I had a much, much longer clip, say several minutes or even an hour, it would be much more convenient to make several sub clips from that instead of scrubbing through the entire thing every time I wanted to find a little element or a little bit of action that I wanted to use for my sequence. In the next lesson, you're gonna learn how to get in here and start editing in the timeline. So check that out coming up next. Let's start turning these assets into something interesting. In this lesson, you will learn how to perform some basic edits on your footage. When you think about editing from a more global perspective, there are some distinct processes that you go through. They'll often include importing your media, selecting your shots, editing to the timeline, adding transitions, making adjustments to your footage and your audio, and then exporting your project. You've already learned how to import your media into Premiere and you've learned how to prep your clips in the source monitor here to make things faster once you start editing in the timeline panel. The timeline panel is where you're going to be spending most of your time in Premiere. And there are a lot of buttons and little interface things that you're going to need to know about. Instead of going through everything right now, we're gonna to get to work on these clips and I'm going to explain things as we go along. One of the most important things to know is how to navigate around in the timeline panel. And there are a few ways to do that. You have scroll bars down here, which you can click and drag and scroll right and left. And then if you click on the end of them, there are these little handles which allow you to zoom in on your project horizontally and zoom out on your project horizontally. And then you have the same thing over here with these vertical scroll bars. You can zoom in on the audio tracks you can zoom in vertically on the video tracks as well. And then you can take these and scroll up and down. I find that process fairly tedious and it's much faster for me and probably you to use the mouse. You can use the mouse scroll wheel and some keyboard modifiers to do all of those same functions. For example, if I want to zoom out, I would hold down alt on the keyboard 
and then move the mouse scroll wheel back. If I want to zoom in horizontally, I hold Alt and then I scroll forward. And when you do this, it zooms in wherever your mouse is located. So if you want to zoom in over here, you put your mouse over here, you hold Alt down, and then you scroll in. It doesn't always zoom around the playhead. So if you want to zoom in where the playhead is located, you have to move your mouse over here and then zoom in. Now to move right and left horizontally, you can hold the control key down and then use the scroll wheel and then you can scroll right and left. If you want to scroll up and down vertically, all you do is just use the mouse scroll wheel. If you're up here in the video tracks, it will scroll up and down through the video tracks. And if you're down here in the audio tracks, it scrolls up and down in the audio tracks. If you want to zoom in vertically, what you can do is move your mouse right over here and then use your scroll wheel. And that will zoom in on these individual audio and video tracks. So most of the time when I'm moving around in the timeline panel, I'm going to be using my mouse scroll wheel. I'm going to zoom out on my sequence here and I'm going to click and drag and select all of these clips and I'm going to delete them. And I'm going to start building out this sequence with the actual shots that I want to use. And the first shot that I want to use is that introduction shot. So I'm going to jump back over here to my project panel. I'm going to expand the wide bin and then double click again on the CCI intro wide. And this is the range that I have selected here for this clip. Have you ever had a recipe for chocolate chip cookies that left something to be desired? It can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe. Not flat, not too dry, delicious flavor, picture perfect, and best of all, easy. Hi, I'm Cheryl Ziegler, and I'm going to show you in this video how to make big bakery style cookies. So I'm going to start off with this shot. So I can take it right from the source window here and pull it right down into my project. Now I can click and drag the playhead and then I can play it right from my sequence here. Now to play and pause your sequence, you can use the space bar. Have you ever had a But you may find it more convenient to use the J, K and L keys. The L key plays forward be for chocolate chip cookies that left something to be the desired. K key stops be... and the J key plays backwards. The cool thing about using these keys is that if you double tap them, thing to be desired, it can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe. You can play at 2x speed. You can also play at 3x speed. And that can be really useful for navigating through your sequence. The other reason why you probably want to keep your hand over on the right side of the keyboard using the JKL keys is because a lot of the other keyboard shortcuts are going to come from this area. The IO keys, for example, are just above the JKL keys, and you can reach the control key and the alt key with your thumb. So it's a very convenient spot to keep your hand. Let's take a look at this clip right from the beginning. If I press the home key, it's going to take me all the way back to the beginning of this sequence. Have you ever had a recipe for chocolate chip cookies? Now at the very beginning of the sequence, there's a little bit of space that I want to get rid of. I want to trim up the beginning of this clip. Now I could have done that over here in the source window and then pull that back into the project, but, but it's going to be much easier to get a general in and out point for your clips and then finesse the timing once you've pulled that clip into the timeline window. So you can see how it looks with the other shots. So if I move my playhead back to the beginning, and if I zoom in on this by pressing the plus key, it'll actually zoom in right where the playhead is positioned. So what I want to do is trim up the beginning here. And if I hover my mouse over the edge of this clip, it changes from a selection tool to a trim tool. You can see I have this little red arrow pointing to the right. So if I click this and I drag this to the right, what that's going to do is perform a trim. This is a basic trim function. I didn't move the clip. What I did was I changed the start position for this clip by clicking the end of it and then dragging that forward. I can also jump to the end of my clip here and then trim up the end bit here by clicking and dragging to the left. Now, when you perform a basic trim like that, it'll often leave a gap. You can see that originally this was back here. And then when I made that trim, you can see that now I have a blank spot. 
sometimes this is what you want, but more times than not, what you want to use is a ripple edit. What a ripple edit does is perform the same kind of trim, but then everything after that trim or everything to the right of it gets scooched down the timeline to basically fill in the gaps. So let me show you how that works. I'm going to grab the end of this clip here and then drag it back to where it was. And now when my mouse is hovered over the edge of this clip, I'm going to hold the control key down. And now the tool is going to change from a trim tool to a ripple edit tool. And now when I click and drag this to the right, watch what happens. Well, it didn't look like anything happened. Let me undo that. And I'm going to zoom out here. Now watch again. I'm going to click and drag to the right. Did you see what happened? The whole clip got scooched to the left. It basically filled in the gap for me. And this is called a ripple edit. Now you can switch to a ripple edit tool if you want by hitting the B key. And that will change the tool to a ripple edit tool. I don't find it particularly useful to change tools like that because the ripple edit tool doesn't allow you to make lasso selections, which I do quite frequently. So I'm going to change this tool back to the selection tool by pressing the V key. And you can see that in the tools panel here, it changed back to the selection tool. With that little edit there, what I've done is clean up the beginning. So I'm going to press the plus key here on my keyboard and zoom in and I'll play right from the beginning. Have you ever had a recipe for So that looks like it's starting too soon. Have you ever had a recipe? It's basically starting right on her word. So, so what I'm going to do is back it up a little bit. So I'm going to hold the control key down and I'm going to click and drag to the left by a few frames. Have you ever had a recipe? For and now I get this nicer starting point here where she's taking a breath and it seems just a little bit more natural to me. Now, if I jump back up here to the source monitor, you can see that there's actually quite a bit left on this entire clip. The part that we're using is this part here that's marked by the in and the out point. But if I scrub through this clip by clicking and dragging, and then I play by pressing the L key. Yeah, definitely. That's almost perfect. Okay. Let me write action. Have you ever had a recipe? For there's another take that Cheryl does of this introduction. So let's play this second introduction. Have you ever had a recipe for chocolate chip cookies that left something to be desired? It can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe. Not flat, not too dry, delicious flavor, picture perfect, and best of all, easy. Hi, I'm Cheryl Ziegler, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to make bakery style delicious chocolate chip cookies. Good. I think since I took these out, I've been adding delicious. Is that okay? Is that going to mess fine. you up? Okay. I'm trying to find just. So there's a second take here, and we have some more options to choose from, but let's keep playing. Have you ever had a recipe for chocolate chip cookies that left something to be desired? It can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe. Not flat, not too dry picture perfect, and best of all, easy. Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to make big bakery style chocolate chip cookies. So I like the last take that Cheryl did, and what I'd probably do is use just the end bit from where she says, hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler. So what I could do here is scroll to that point. So it's right about here. I'm going to mark another in point. Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to make big bakery style chocolate chip cookies. And then I'll mark an out point right here. I'm going to jump back to the timeline panel, and there are several ways that I can edit together this first part of the clip and the second part of the clip. What I need to do is find where Cheryl says, hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler in this first clip and then get rid of all the stuff that's after that. And you're going to learn how to do that coming up in the next lesson. In this lesson, you will pick up right where you left off and learn a few more techniques for editing these clips together in the timeline. So picking up from the last lesson, what I'm trying to do here is find the spot where Cheryl says, 
hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler, in this first clip, and then get rid of all the stuff that's after that. So let me click and drag and find that spot here. So it's right about here. So to do this, I can... So to chop off the end of this clip, I have a number of options. I can take the trim tool and just click and drag back right to the playhead. And because snapping is on, once I get close to the playhead, that action will snap right to the playhead, which makes it very easy. Let me undo that. I can also slice this clip right here, which is another one of these tools. You can see there's a razor tool here if we hit the C key. And I could grab that and I could slice this clip right here. Then I could change back to the selection tool. And I could make a selection and then I could just delete this. It does the same exact thing. Let me undo both of those actions. Another way that I can do a very similar thing is with the keyboard shortcut Control K. Now, if I zoom in here and I move the playhead back, you can see that I have added an edit, which did a very similar thing as the razor tool. Now, this is a little bit different than grabbing the razor tool and slicing this clip because Control K only adds edits on the tracks that are selected. So if you look over here, you can see that video one and audio one, two, and three are all selected. If I undo that last action, and then I deselect video one, and I go to that same point, and I hit Control K again, now look what happened. It only added an edit to the audio portion, which is not what I wanted. So I'm gonna reselect video one, and I'm gonna undo that. If you have a sequence with a lot of media clips in it, you can also select individual clips and then use Control K to add an edit or split those individual clips. Yet another way that you can add this clip in is over here in the source monitor. There are two functions right here. There's an insert and an overwrite. This will add this clip to my sequence wherever the playhead is located. And it will add this clip to whichever video and audio track are selected for the source patching. So let me zoom out here and I'll show you what that means. So now you can see my whole clip here. And so I wanna add this clip right here. If I press the insert button, that's going to insert this clip and everything to the right of this clip is going to get scooched to the right. So it's basically making room or making space for this clip to go. And then it's inserting it on video one and audio one. Let me undo that. If I select audio two and video two, if I hover over, you can see that it says source patching for inserts and overwrites. Now, when I press insert, it's gonna do the same action, but it's going to insert that clip on the second video track and the second audio track because that's where I have the source patching selected here. Let me undo that. I'm gonna put this back to video one and audio one here. And let's take a look at what overwrite does. Overwrite adds the clip to the sequence, but it overwrites whatever was there. So now if I play this, of all, easy. Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler, and in this video, it basically took this part of the clip and it overwrote directly over this clip, which is fine. All of these ways are perfectly acceptable. I'm gonna undo that there and show you that there's also keyboard shortcuts for these, which just happen to be right under the JKL keys, and that's comma and period. In my source window here, if I hit the comma key, that's going to perform an overwrite, and it's gonna put that clip right down here. And so now let me play this transition here. Easy. Hi. It's a little bit weird. You can hear there's two breaths there. So let me zoom in on this position and see if I can refine that. Easy. Hi. I think what I'll probably do is take this part of the clip and just pull it to the right just a little bit by holding control and performing a ripple edit. Easy. Hi. My that was a little bit too much. Let me scooch that back just a little bit by a few frames. Hi. Easy. Maybe I'll take this clip here and I'll just scooch it back with a ripple edit in this direction. All easy. Hi. My name is Cheryl Ziegler. Easy. Hi. My name is so that's not the smoothest transition, but I'm gonna clean that up by adding a cutaway shot. 
I can also change where this edit point is by using the rolling edit tool. The rolling edit tool trims the in point of one clip and the out point of the other while leaving the combined duration of the two clips unchanged. To better see that, I'm going to zoom out here. And I could grab the rolling edit tool by pressing N on the keyboard, or I could come over here and actually change the tool by clicking in the tools panel. But it's also available as a mouse modifier by hovering the mouse right over this edit point and then holding down control. So if I click on this edit point and I pull this back, you can see what that's done there. It's moved the edit point, but it hasn't changed the length of these two clips combined. Let me undo that. If I were to perform a ripple edit, I would hold control and just move the mouse over just a little bit. And now when I do a ripple edit, it changes the length because I'm basically changing the out point of this clip and I'm deleting the gap that would have been created between these two clips. So I'm effectively changing the duration of these two combined clips. Let me undo that. If I just perform a regular edit, the combined duration of these two clips has changed, but there's a gap in the middle. So to get rid of the gap, I could take this and slide my footage back down and it'll snap to the edge of this other media clip here. Let me undo that. I could also right click in the middle here and choose ripple delete, and that'll do a very similar thing. But I am changing the length of these two clips, which is not something that I want to do. So let me undo that and see where this edit point is now. And best of all, easy. Hi, my name is Cheryl. So I want to get it right where she says best hi. Best of all, easy. Right about here. So I'm going to hover right over this edit here. I'm going to hold control down, which brings up the rolling edit tool. I'm going to click and drag right to the playhead. Easy. Hi, my name is Cheryl Zick. And that's right about where I want to have that edit point. Now, I know it doesn't look very smooth, but I'm going to patch it together with a cutaway shot. And you're going to learn how to do that coming up next. In this lesson, you will learn how to add illustrative cutaway shots to your video. So a cutaway shot or a B-roll shot is footage that's inserted to help illustrate a point, to help tell a story, or to hide things like a zoom, a camera shake, or something else that you don't want the viewer to see. In this case, I'm going to use a cutaway shot to do two things. It's going to help illustrate what Cheryl is talking about, and it's also going to help hide this transition here that we've created from the first part of the take to the last part of the take when she gave a stronger delivery of those last few lines. So to help make this a little easier, I've created a little PDF here with a shot list in the order that we will be assembling these clips. And you can find this PDF along with the rest of the downloaded files for this course. So you can see right up at the top, it says CCI intro wide. And then I have another shot listed called CCI cookie close up cutaway. So let's jump back to the project and locate that file. Now the easiest way to do that is to just search for it. So let me search cookie and see what comes up here. In the cutaway folder, I see, oh yeah, right here, cookie close-up cutaway. So if I double click this, it's going to open up in the source monitor. And let me scrub along here and see what we have. All right, there's a little kind of rack focusing, a slow little tilt, and then a little bit of a rack focus, and then a kind of nasty zoom out and some more kind of shaky camera stuff. I think I can probably grab a portion of this footage here, probably right here after this initial focusing takes place. So I'm going to mark an in point with I on the keyboard. And then I'm going to scroll along here. I'll mark an out point right before this snap zoom happens by pressing O on the keyboard. Now, what I want to do is add this cutaway here so that it ends right on this edit. So what I could do is position my playhead right on that edit by holding shift and then that playhead will snap right to that edit. Then over here in the source monitor, I'm just going to drag the video only right into my sequence. And now I have something like this. Let me play it right before this cutaway happens. It can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe. Not flat, not too dry, delicious flavor, picture perfect, and best of all, easy. Hi. When Cheryl was talking about the attributes of the cookie, this gave a nice illustrative shot for the viewer to look at. It also helped 
hide this nasty transition that we had before. And now it's looking much more natural because now that the viewer is looking at a different shot, you really can't tell that we're switching to a different take. Now there is some weirdness going on in the audio there where you can hear kind of some weird things going on with the breath, but that's something that we can fix later. So I'm going to zoom in here and I'm also going to expand this audio one track here so I can see the audio waveforms. And this will help me with the timing on where I want this clip to start. So I want this clip to start right when Cheryl starts talking about the attributes of the cookie. So let me just scroll along here. The right recipe, not the right recipe. So right about here, I think. Just the right recipe, not flat. And I also want this clip to start maybe just as the camera is moving because if I start it right here, watch what the camera does. Just the right recipe, not flat. It just kind of sits and hovers for a second. And I think that's just a little bit confusing. So I'm going to make a little edit to this in point here by just using the trim tool. And when I do, the program monitor is showing me exactly where the new start frame is going to be. So if I scrub slowly, I can see right here, the camera is just starting to move. So I'm just going to scooch just maybe a couple of frames back. And that's where I want this new start point to happen right here. Not flat, not, not, not flat. Maybe even a few frames after that. Not, not flat, not too dry. Yeah, right about there looks pretty good. And now I'm going to pull that clip so that it starts right between the end of this word and the start of when she says not flat. Right recipe, not flat recipe. So right about here. The right recipe, not flat, not too dry, delicious flavor. Now you see that there's a little bit left over here where we run out of frames on this clip here and it cuts back to this camera and then there's that weird transition again. So let's see if we can fix that. There may be some more frames here that we can sneak out of this clip. Nope, there actually isn't. So I can probably adjust this edit point here, maybe just pull it back a hair. So I'm going to hold control and then do a ripple edit right back to here. Best of all, easy. Hi, my- Ooh, did you hear that? What I did was I essentially moved the edit point so that this clip starts right about the time when Cheryl was going to take a breath in this clip. So when it cuts back to this camera, Hi. we see a small little breath and it looks and sounds pretty natural. Let me play that again for you. And best of all, easy. Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler. So let me play the whole thing right from the beginning. I'm going to press home on my keyboard. Okay, thank you. Okay. And apparently something got goofed up with the beginning of the shot. So let's fix that as well. I'm going to hold control here and just scroll to right about here. I don't want to catch her in the middle of kind of opening her mouth for that first breath. Have you ever had a recipe for chocolate chip cookies? And I think what I'll probably do is add a little bit of a fade from black in the beginning of this clip that'll kind of transition in from that a little bit awkward breath that happens there. So let me put the playhead back at the beginning and let's play this down. Have you ever had a recipe for chocolate chip cookies that left something to be desired? It can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe. Not flat, not too dry, delicious flavor, picture perfect, and best of all, easy. Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to make big bakery style chocolate chip cookies. I'd say that's pretty good. So there's a little bit of weirdness, I think, at the end of this clip here. It doesn't quite flow exactly the way I'd like into the next clip. It just kind of hangs out and it goes out of focus. And to my eye, it looks a little bit weird. So what I might do is just trim this back a hair until the cookies are just a little bit more in focus and then slide the clip down. When I do that though, now the in point of the clip is not going to be lined up where I want. So I want to get back there and adjust the in point for this cookie close up cutaway here. To make that navigation a little bit easier, what I can do is come over here and toggle on the track targeting for video two. Then I can press the up arrow and that will jump the playhead to the previous edit point on all the targeted tracks. So if I press the up arrow again, it's going to go to the next edit point here because video one is also targeted. If I press the down arrow, it's going to go to the next edit point as in the next edit point later in time or to the right, but only on the targeted tracks. 
If I press the down arrow again, you can see it lands right here. But if I take targeting off of video two and I press up, now it's going to jump right back to the beginning because this is the previous edit point of the targeted track, which is video one and audio one and also audio two and audio three, but there's nothing on there. So I'm gonna enable track targeting for video two. And then from this point, I'm gonna press down. And now what I need to do is adjust the beginning of this track here so that it comes in right here. So I'm gonna trim this back and now check out what I have. Not flat, not too dry, delicious flavor, picture perfect, and best of all, easy. Now, this still looks a little bit weird to me. So I'm gonna zoom back in here. And another thing that I can do is take it right from just before the camera starts moving, and then I can just stretch the clip out. And to do that, I'm gonna grab the rate stretch tool, which is R on the keyboard. You can also see it's right over here. And now what I can do is grab the end of this clip. What the rate stretch tool does is shortens or lengthens clips by either speeding them up or slowing them down respectively. But it leaves the in and the out points unchanged, which means I didn't change where this clip was coming in. I only changed how long it was happening. So it's basically filling in some of the space between those frames so that I can get this nice start point that I was looking for before. Let's see what it looks like. The right recipe. Not flat, not too dry, delicious flavor, picture perfect, and best of all, easy. Hi, my- That looks pretty good to me. I got the nice in point that I was looking for, and it was just the right movement for my eye. I got the right out point where it was just still barely in focus on those cookies. And then it cut to this later take where Cheryl was delivering the end of the intro, and it was a little bit stronger of a performance. And again, to do that, I used the rate stretch tool, which is R on the keyboard. I'm gonna press V to go back to the selection tool here. So this is looking pretty good, but we're not quite done yet. In the next lesson, you will see how to use all the basic skills you've learned so far to build out the first few minutes of this instructional video. So check that out coming up next. In this lesson, you will see how to use the skills that you've learned so far to start building out the first few minutes of this instructional video. In this lesson, I'm gonna go a little bit faster as I start assembling these shots in this sequence because what I want you to take away is not so much how I'm doing things because you will have learned that already in previous lessons in this course. What I want you to take away from this lesson is the why I'm doing what I'm doing, why I'm making cuts where I'm making them, why I'm adding a cutaway shot here and there, because there aren't actually tools in Adobe Premiere Pro or or any video application that I'm aware of that teaches you about what works and what doesn't for a particular edit. It's all about the timing and the flow of how these shots work together. And that's what I want you to learn in this lesson. I'm just gonna pull up the shot list here to find out what shots are coming up next. So I need the ingredients wide and then the ingredients cutaway shots. So let me look that up here. I know the ingredients wide is gonna be down here. Here we go. The double click to bring it up in the source monitor. So let me play this down and see what we have. I can see that it's about 30 seconds long, but I'm almost certain that I don't want the whole thing. So let me mark an in and out point and then we'll get it on the timeline. Okay, sure. <laughs> Perfect. And action. First, let's go over the ingredients. You will need two cups of all-purpose flour, half a teaspoon of baking soda, half a teaspoon of kosher salt, three quarters of a cup of melted butter, one cup of packed brown sugar, half a cup of white sugar, one egg and one egg yolk, a tablespoon of vanilla extract, and two cups of chocolate chips. All right, so I'm gonna put an out point right here, and I'm gonna add that right after the introduction. Chocolate chip cookies. First, let's go over the ingredients. Okay, so if I play that right there, you can see there's another weird transition bakery style chocolate chip cookies. So let's see if we can figure that out. Now, according to the shot list, I don't have any other shots that were planned for that section, but I'm pretty sure there are a few extra B-roll shots in here. If I look at the cutaway list, I see a shot here that says cookie spinning cutaway. And I don't think that's in this shot list anywhere. No, it's not. So let me pull that up here. Cookie spinning cutaway. All right, so we have the cookies and they're spinning. 
on a little turntable here. So I can probably grab a couple of frames of this and use that to patch together this cut right here. This looks like a pretty good start point. I'm going to hit I. And I'm just going to hit O here. I don't know if that's the right length, but I'll see if it works. I'm going to show you how to make big bakery style chocolate chip cookies. I think I want that to come in right when she says big. So let me just move the start position right here. Big bakery style chocolate chip cookies. I think that works pretty good right there. So I'm going to hit control K and add an edit point and because this track is targeted. It's going to add the edit point right here. There was already an edit point between these clips. So that's not really going to change anything there. And then I will select this clip over here and I'll just delete that because I only want this cutaway shot right here. Big bakery style chocolate chip cookies. I may want to add just a little bit of a break in here, just a little beat after she says that before she goes into the next little ingredient thing here. So I'm going to zoom in here and just move this clip down a hair and extend this cookie cutaway clip out just a little bit. First, let's. You can hear the audio is doing some weird things there. First. But I'll fix the audio later. I'm not really too concerned about that. So I have this ingredients shot right here. And there was also a cutaway ingredients shot. And I can't see that because I left cookie in the search bar up here. So I'll just delete that. And I can actually type in ingredients. Here we go. CCI ingredients cutaway. So let's see what we have here. First, let's go over the ingredients. You will need two cups of all purpose flour, half a teaspoon of baking soda, half a teaspoon of kosher salt, three quarters of a cup of melted butter. All right. So this is basically just a nice tight shot. It looks like it was taken at the exact same time as this wide shot here. And I'll just scroll through the end. All right. So I can probably mark an out point somewhere in here. And this shot really isn't doing anything before her finger hits the bowl. So, so I'm going to play what's going on here. Ingredients. You will need two cups of all purpose. All right. When she says all purpose, I think that could be a good spot to try and line these clips up. So what I'm going to do up here is I'm going to click over here to this audio waveform, and that's going to bring up the audio for this clip that I have selected CCI ingredients cutaway. So I'm going to zoom in here by pressing plus on the keyboard. And then right here, this is where she says all. I'm going to mark that as my end point. And then I'm just going to drag the video down and snap that right to the playhead, which is lined up right where she says all in this other clip. Of all purpose flour, half a teaspoon of baking soda, half a teaspoon of kosher salt, three quarters of a cup of melted butter, one cup of packed brown sugar, half a cup of white sugar, one egg and one egg yolk, a tablespoon of vanilla extract, and two cups of chocolate chips. That looks pretty good. I don't really like what's happening at the end of this clip. A tablespoon of vanilla extract. So what I'd probably do is just trim this back and go back to the wide shot here. And one egg yolk, a tablespoon of vanilla extract, and two cups of chocolate chips. Somewhere in there, I think, looks good. In the next lesson, I'm going to continue working on the next few shots in this sequence, and you're going to see exactly how it's put together. In this lesson, I'm going to continue working on the next few shots in this sequence, and you are going to learn exactly how they're put together. All right, let's see what is coming up next here. Now I have preheat oven cutaway, preheat oven description, one preheat oven description wide. So I think there's two shots that have preheat oven description, and there's also a cutaway shot. So let me look at what that is. Let's start with the preheat description one. 
So I'm going to clear the search bar here. And I'll pull up preheat oven description one. Okay, no problem. Okay. Before you start assembling the ingredients, preheat your oven to 325 degrees. This temperature is a little bit lower than the standard 375 degrees because we're making extra large cookies. So we want to take the low and slow approach. We want the cookies to be perfectly baked on the outside and not extra brown while the inside gets the perfect texture as well. Okay, let's check out this other clip here, CCI preheat oven description wide. Because we are making larger cookies, you'll want to take the low and slow approach. We want the middle of these cookies to be a perfect golden brown before the edges get too dark. So I think I like the beginning of this clip here because she says, before you start assembling the ingredients, she says before we start assembling the ingredients and that makes more sense to me. So I'm going to get this added to my sequence here. Start, a start right here. Before you start assembling the ingredients, preheat your oven to 325 degrees. But I really don't like how she ends this clip. We want the cookies to be perfectly baked on the outside and not extra brown, while the inside gets the perfect texture as well. That just sounds a little bit weird. So, low approach. I think I can cut it right after she says low and slow approach. We want to take the low and slow approach. So I'm going to mark an out point there and then add this to my sequence. Then I'm going to pull up the CCI preheat oven wide. You want to take the low and slow approach. And then I think I can pick up this clip right here because I liked the end bit of this clip a little bit better. So I'm going to mark an endpoint. We want the middle of these cookies to be a perfect golden brown before the edges get too dark. And I think that's what I want right there. So I'm just going to add that right here. This temperature is a little bit lower than the standard 375 degrees because we're making extra large cookies. So we want to take the low and slow approach. We want the middle of these cookies to be a perfect golden brown before the edges get too dark. So that sounds pretty good. But again, we have this weird transition here between this clip and this clip right here. So I know I can glue some of that back together with a cutaway shot because I did see that there was a preheat oven cutaway. Here we go. Load that in the source monitor here. Oh, it looks like there's two takes of this. All right, so we can probably pick it up right here. And then end right there. So I'll just add this right to the beginning, right after the ingredient shot. Before you start assembling the ingredients, preheat your oven to 325 degrees. This temperature is a little bit lower than the standard 375. And I think I can probably trim it so that we come back to her right after she says 325 degrees. But I want to make sure on this clip to 325 degrees. that she sets the temperature and she pulls her hand away. So what I can do is I'll just trim up the end here. So I'm going to hit Y on the keyboard and I'm going to change to the slip tool. What the slip tool is going to allow me to do is leave the start of the clip set here and the end of the clip here, but it'll allow me to slide the footage in between these two boundaries. So essentially I'll be changing the in point and the out point at the same exact time, but I will leave the duration of this clip exactly the same. So what I want to see is the end of the clip here. I want to see her hand just leaving the knob. So I'm going to click and drag to the left here. On the left hand side, it's showing me the start frame. And on the right hand side, it's showing me the end frame. So I think I can go right about there. Let me see what that looks like. Before you start assembling the ingredients, preheat your oven to 325 degrees. This temperature is a little I'll switch back to the selection tool here. I think that was pretty close. I may extend this out by just a few frames. 25 degrees. This temperature is a little bit. I think that works pretty well. So we want to take the low and slow approach. We want the middle of these cookies to be a perfect golden brown before the edges get too dark. According to the shot list, I don't have any other shots listed that were planned for this shot, but let me see if I can find another shot to patch that little edit point together. 
I have a shot listed here, cookie close up on rack cutaway. Let me take a look at that. Ooh, I see. We got a camera going into the cookies on the rack and a nice little close up here of these two cookies. I think that would actually work really well as she's talking about the level of doneness on these cookies. So I might pick an endpoint right here and then pick an out point right here and see if that works to slot in here. Let me check this out. We want the middle of these cookies to be a perfect golden brown before the edges get too dark. Well, okay, that's not going to work super great. Let me just slide it back and then extend this to the left a little bit. We want the middle of these cookies to be a perfect golden brown before the edges get too dark. I think that works pretty well. I don't want to have this clip go when the camera starts moving back to the right. Let me see if I can pull this a few frames this way. Let's see if this works. We want the middle of these cookies to be a... Mm, I don't think that works. So I'm going to double click this media clip and that's going to bring it back up in the source monitor here. And now I can actually make adjustments to the in and the out point here in the source monitor. And that will change what's happening with this clip in the sequence. I think I might be able to actually pick it up right here when the camera starts moving right. So I'm going to grab right in the middle here where this hand tool is and just slide this over. And then over here, that's going to update in the sequence. We want the middle of these cookies to be a perfect golden brown before the edges get too dark. I like that. That looks pretty good. Now you can see there are some more shots in the list, but I'm going to let you work on those on your own. Let me just play this down from the beginning. Have you ever had a recipe for chocolate chip cookies that left something to be desired? It can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe. Not flat, not too dry, delicious flavor, picture perfect, and best of all, easy. Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to make big bakery style chocolate chip cookies. First, let's go over the ingredients. You will need two cups of all-purpose flour, half a teaspoon of baking soda, half a teaspoon of kosher salt, three quarters of a cup of melted butter, one cup of packed brown sugar, half a cup of white sugar, one egg and one egg yolk, a tablespoon of vanilla extract, and two cups of chocolate chips. Before you start assembling the ingredients, preheat your oven to 325 degrees. This temperature is a little bit lower than the standard 375 degrees because we're making extra large cookies, so we want to take the low and slow approach. We want the middle of these cookies to be a perfect golden brown before the edges get too dark. All right, so playing that back, there was a few things that I saw in there Right at the end here, I think I could add just a little bit more space because it felt like she rushed into the second line here. The low and slow approach. We want. So I'm just going to do a ripple edit and push this out just a hair. Approach. We want the middle of these cookies to be. And that actually works pretty well. We want the middle of these cookies to be a perfect golden brown before the edges. There's also some audio transitions here that are not super smooth. And that's something you're going to learn how to fix coming up next. In this lesson, you will see how to finesse the audio by adding some audio transitions. So like I mentioned in the last lesson, I think this cut at this point is looking pretty good. But some of these audio transitions are not very nice sounding. They sound a little abrupt and a little rough around the edges. Now you're going to learn more about effects in the next two lessons, but I did want to go over some basic audio transitions, which can be found right here in the effects panel. So if you jump down here underneath audio transitions, there's only one folder and that's crossfade. And there are three default audio transitions. You have constant gain, constant power and exponential fade. And all of these do a very similar thing. When you apply one of these crossfades between two media clips with audio, the transition will fade one of the clips down and simultaneously fade the other clip up. And these three transitions differ in how much and how fast they crossfade. But they all do a very similar thing. You see that constant power here is highlighted as blue. And if I right click on it, it's because this one has been set as the default transition. If I wanted to set constant gain, 
I would right click and just set that there or exponential fade. But right now I have it set to constant power. The constant gain crossfade changes audio at a constant rate in and out as it transitions between clips. This crossfade can sometimes sound abrupt. So that one I don't really use. The constant power crossfade creates a smooth, gradual transition, which is more similar to the dissolve transition you might use between two video clips. This crossfade decreases audio for the first clip slowly at first, then quickly towards the end of the transition. For the second clip, this crossfade increases audio quickly at first, and then more slowly towards the end of the transition. So this is a pretty smooth audio crossfade right here. The exponential fade fades out the first clip over a smooth logarithmic curve while fading up this second clip also over a smooth logarithmic curve. So again, all of these do a very similar thing. They fade out one clip while they simultaneously fade in the second clip. So let me show you exactly how these work. I'm going to jump over here in the timeline panel and let's find one of these transitions that maybe could use a little bit of a crossfade between them. So I'm going to zoom in here right on the playhead with the plus key. And I'll play this little bit right here. First of all, easy. Hi, my name is Cheryl Z. So that's not super abrupt, but let's hear the difference when we apply a default transition. I can just drag one of these right over to the clip, just like that. I'll just delete that. But it's probably going to be faster if you use the keyboard shortcut. The keyboard shortcut to apply the default audio transition is Control Shift D. Control Shift D will apply the default audio transition to any clips that are close to the playhead here. And you can see because these two clips are right on the playhead, it applied that transition right here. So let's hear what this sounds like now. Easy. Hi. It may be a touch smoother. Easy. Now I can adjust the size of this transition. If I hover my mouse over, you see that the selection tool changes from a trim tool, which it is right here, to a kind of transition trim tool. So I can click and drag this, and now it'll start fading out this clip sooner and fading this clip in sooner, or the transition will happen over a longer period of time. So now if I play this audio transition here, well, easy. Hi, my you can see it's making a nice smooth fade between these clips. Now in order for this crossfade to work, there has to be material after this edit right here in order to fade down. If this was the end of the clip and there was nothing after that, then this transition wouldn't have anything to fade down after this point, so it wouldn't work correctly. If I double click on this clip to bring it up in the source monitor, you can see that this is the in and the out point for this source clip that I have marked to use. Now the portion of the source clip that I'm not using is called a handle. The handle between the clip's start point and the in point that I marked is sometimes called head material, and the handle between the clip's out point and the end of the media is sometimes called tail material. So when you're applying these transitions, if there's not handles after this edit point and before this edit point, or in other words, if there's not tail material here or head material here, this transition won't work properly because there won't be anything to fade up or fade down. But because there is, this is going to work fine. And in most cases, it's going to work just fine. Now, if I jump back to the beginning, if I try to apply a default transition here, you can see that the transition applies, but again, there's not anything before this point to fade down. So essentially what this is going to do is just fade this clip up very, very subtly. Now applying an audio transition to do a fade up in this particular case will work, but it's not usually my preference. What I like to use instead is audio clip keyframes. So because I have this clip expanded, I can see the audio waveforms in here. If I collapse this down, I can't. But as soon as I expand this, I can see audio waveforms, I can see what's happening on the left channel and the right channel, and there's a line in between here. And you can see as I hover over this, it says volume level. This is the volume level for this particular clip. And while my selection tool is hovered over here, I can take this volume level and I can push it up or I can click and drag it down. I'm just gonna undo that. I can also hold control down. And if I click, I can add a keyframe. If I add another keyframe over here, I can adjust 
the volume of this clip. So what I will frequently do is create my own kind of audio transitions with clip volume level keyframes. So I'll usually drop two keyframes in and then I'll take one of them and I'll pull it down. And so now what's going to happen between this keyframe and this keyframe is the volume is going to start at negative infinity and then it's going to ramp up to zero decibels over this time period. And so now listen to what's going to happen. Have you ever had a It basically faded in the audio. Now the reason why I like to use keyframes in this situation over an audio transition is because it's faster. Let me just undo this for a second. The reason why it's faster is because I want this transition to happen between right here, right when she just starts talking in the beginning of this clip. If I were to try to do that with an audio transition, what I'd have to do is apply the audio transition and then I would have to adjust it out over here. But you see at this particular zoom level, I don't get that transition trim tool. What I have to do at this point is zoom in a level and then I can adjust the transition here so that it will do a similar thing. And this for me is an extra step. It's much faster for me to just hover my mouse over here, control click, click, and then pull it down. For me, that's one less step and I can do that much, much faster. And now if I wanna make any adjustments to these two keyframes, maybe I want to shorten this transition here. So I will hold shift so that this keyframe snaps to the position that it was previously in. I can move this over to the left and I can even do that when I'm zoomed way out like this. You can see I can still grab these keyframes and make adjustments, which you cannot do to these transitions here. I cannot grab this transition and make an adjustment. Now I still can get to the transition adjustment from here, but I have to go over here to the effects controls. And because I have this transition selected, now I can jump up here and I can make an adjustment to it. Now all of these methods are completely valid and they're completely useful. I'm just showing you my preference for fades at the beginning and the end of media clips, I typically will use clip volume keyframes. So let's keep playing here and see what we can do to clean up the rest of the audio here. Bakery style chocolate chip cookies. First, you can see that transition does not sound super hot. So what I would probably do is see if there's enough audio here to extend this. So we keep that kind of low level background noise in there, but we'll massage it a little bit. Chip cookies. I'm going to apply a default audio transition right here and then see how that sounds. First, let's go over. I think that sounds pretty good, but I'd probably want to make this a little bit bigger. So what I would do is jump up here to the effects controls panel and maybe pull this back a little bit. First, so I get a nice clean breath there and it's not short sounding. And then I might take this and drop two keyframes right here and just pull this down so that this trailing noise comes down a little bit. First, let's go over the ingredients. That to me sounds a little bit smoother. Let me jump to the next edit point by hitting the down arrow and I'll hit it again. Actually, if I want to get to the next edit on video one and audio one, I'll just deselect video two and then press down and that will jump to the next edit point only on video one and audio one. Before you start a so that sounds a little bit funny as well. Let me try another audio transition here. Before you. That made it perhaps a little bit smoother, but still there's something not quite right here. Let me just make a little space. I'm going to delete this audio transition and I'm just going to zoom way up here. You can see on the waveform, it looks like there's a little bit of noise and there's a little bit of junk here in the audio. It looks like there's a little bit of pop or something happens with the microphone right at this point. So there's not a great way to fix this. So what I might do is put two keyframes here and two keyframes here. I won't fade them all the way down, but I will reduce the intensity in this transition. Before you start a sound. And that to me sounds just a little bit better. It sounds like this whole audio track on all these clips could use just a hair of denoising. But for right now, I think these audio transitions will help a lot. There's certainly a lot more to learn about working with audio in Premiere, but with these two things, audio transitions and clip volume keyframes, you can very quickly massage the transition between your clips and make the audio sound much smoother. 
In the next lesson, you're going to get a brief overview of the video effects available in Adobe Premiere Pro. In this lesson, you will get a brief overview of the video effects offered in Premiere Pro. So let's jump over to the effects panel here and take a look at what Premiere has for video effects. You can see there are a bunch of effect bins here and each one contains a bunch of effects. There are so many effects, in fact, that it would be impossible to even attempt to cover them in one lesson or even 30 lessons because there's so much you can do with the built-in effects inside of Premiere. However, I did want to highlight a few effects that I think you'll be turning to quite often. A lot of times when you're working with footage, you're going to want to make some basic image adjustments. So I'm going to jump to the end of this sequence here. And this last shot that I have of these cookies on these racks is one of the shots that sticks out quite a bit. Compared to the other cutaway shots, this clip right here just looks a little bit overlit and it looks like it could use a little bump in contrast and maybe a little bit of color tweaking. Now, just like everything else in Premiere, there's several different ways that I can go about making some color and contrast adjustments to this clip. But let me show you a couple of simple ones. I'm just going to search for an effect here called Fast Color Corrector. And I'm going to drop this right on this clip here. I'm going to expand the effects controls panel here so we have a little bit more room to work with. Now, Fast Color Corrector has a bunch of options. I'll just show you a couple of the quick ones. You see there's a big color wheel here. I can use this to make subtle or drastic color changes to this clip. If I thought this looked too orange, I could pull this over towards blue. If I thought this looked too green, I could maybe pull this over towards magenta. And I have a pretty big range in terms of how much or how little I'm affecting the color of this clip. I'm just going to reset that right up here. Down here, I have some more basic adjustments. I have saturation, so maybe I want to boost the saturation just a little bit. That looks like it's a little bit too much, maybe like 120. And when I do, it actually looks a little bit too red, so I may pull this just a hair down to blue, just ever so slightly. I can use this section right here to adjust the contrast. I might want to pull the shadows down a little bit. Maybe take this mid-tone and drop that by just a little bit and then pump up the whites, maybe just a tiny bit. And if I toggle this on and off, you can see it does have a pretty big difference. So this is just one way that I could make this change. I'm going to select that and delete it. I can also use something like three way color corrector, which is a heck of a lot more complex. Three-way color corrector gives you color wheels for the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights. And then if you click master, you get a master color wheel, just like you find in the fast color corrector. So I could take this and I might do something like pull the shadows down to blue. Maybe pull the midtones down to blue and then take the highlights and maybe push those to orange a little bit. I might do the same thing with the black level and the white level. Maybe just kick down this middle slider here just a hair. And just make a few more adjustments in here until I thought it looked right. You can see I'm getting a nice punchy look here as well. I could also use something like curves, which is another effect that I use quite often. And I could use this to give it a little bit of contrast here. Maybe punch these down, pull down the shadows a little bit. Maybe take the red channel and pull down the mids just a hair. Maybe increase the blue in the mids just a little bit. And you can see I can get a very similar effect with this RGB curves effect here. So a lot of different ways to do the same thing. But the general idea is when you want to make a change to one of your clips, you find the right effect and you may have to try one or two before you find exactly the right one you're looking for. You apply it to your clip and then you make some adjustments to the effect 
until you're getting the desired result. Now that may be blurring your footage, it may be sharpening your footage, it may be adjusting the brightness or the contrast or the saturation. It could be a number of things, but that's the general idea. And it'll probably take a little bit of experimentation until you figure out what tools you like to work with. Sometimes I like to work with curves. Sometimes I like to work with the three-way color corrector. Sometimes I can just use the fast color corrector. And if I clear the search bar here and I look under color correction, you'll see that there are even more effects that I can use to make those kind of adjustments to this clip. Now, let me jump over here. Let's say you like the look of your footage, but maybe you want to give it something like a little bit of a vignette. Well, you can do that. And a really easy way to do that is with a curves adjustment. I'm going to throw an RGB curves on here. And the cool thing about the most recent few versions of Premiere is that all of the standard effects now come with a masking option. So what I could do to create a vignette here is I could just pull this down in the middle here and then create an elliptical mask. And then I'll just adjust the mask here. Maybe add just a few more points to do this kind of thing. And then I can invert this, maybe add some feathering, push the mask expansion out a little bit, maybe pull this down a little bit darker. And check that out. Now I have a nice vignette here on my footage, but that's only to this one clip. As soon as I go to the next clip, I lose my vignette. So what if I wanted to create a vignette for all of these clips? Well, that's really easy to do. I could come over here to the project panel. I'll go to new adjustment layer. I'll leave it at the default settings because those match my sequence settings. And I'll pull an adjustment layer out here and I'll make it the size of my sequence. And then I can actually just take this effect here that I put on this clip and I'll grab it right here and I will cut it, control X, and I'll paste it on this adjustment layer. And it's gonna look exactly the same, but now this adjustment layer is affecting all of the clips below here. So now I have a vignette here and here and basically everywhere. So I can use an adjustment layer to apply effects to, and that'll apply the effects to all the tracks below the adjustment layer. If I pull up a track above here, you can see no vignette, but when I put it back down where it was before, now I get the nice looking vignette. So very, very flexible. I can add effects to individual clips or I can add effects to an adjustment layer and have it affect multiple clips over a long period of time. I'm gonna delete this here. Now there are many other video effects and that's going to take some experimentation on your part. There's also several video transitions if you look right under here. And in my opinion, most of these are a little hokey. The only one that I use consistently is this cross dissolve right here. And cross dissolve does pretty much exactly what you think it would do. I'm gonna to toggle off the eye for the second video track here. And I'm gonna drop a cross dissolve in between these two clips right here and watch what it does. Oh, easy. Hi, my name Exactly what you thought, right? It's going to fade the opacity of this layer down while simultaneously fading the opacity of this layer up. And this is pretty much the only video transition that I use. It's also set to my default video transition. So I just click down here and jump to another edit point. If I wanna add that video transition here, just like adding an audio transition, it's control D on the keyboard. Now you see that added the video transition on this clip and this clip right here, which is not what I wanted. So instead, I'm gonna undo that. I'm just gonna select this edit right here and control D. Now, if I go to the beginning of my sequence by pressing the home button, I can add a cross dissolve right here, and this will essentially fade up from black. Have you ever had a recipe? Which is what I wanted. I'm gonna delete these two transitions. And I think it might look nice to throw a cross dissolve right here. Not flat, not. And in order to see that, I'm going to have to toggle on the track output. Recipe. Not flat, not too dry, delicious flavor, picture perfect. And I get a nice little fade up 
right there. Now if I go all the way to the end of my sequence, I can't use a crossfade here to fade to black because if I put a crossfade on this cutaway shot, it's going to pull the opacity down and reveal this track below, and that's not what I want. So instead, what I will usually do is come over here, click on the new item button and choose black video, and then pull black video in here, select this edit right here, and control D. Then I'll come to just a few frames after, control K to split it, and then delete the rest of it. And now I have a nice fade to black. Edges get too dark. Super simple and very easy to do. Again, there are a ton of video effects and video transitions in Premiere. We only covered just a handful of them. Take some time and explore the effects, push some things around and find out what works and what doesn't work for you. In the next lesson, you're gonna learn about a fantastic feature in Adobe Premiere Pro called Master Clip Effects. One of the most useful features in the recent versions of Adobe Premiere Pro is Master Clip Effects. And in this lesson, you will learn how they work. In the last lesson, you got a basic overview of how to apply video effects to individual clips and apply them to something called an adjustment layer to affect multiple clips that fall on the tracks below where that adjustment layer is placed. Both of those methods of applying effects are very, very useful, and I expect you'll be using them quite a bit. However, sometimes you're going to have to apply effects to the same source clip over and over and over. And depending on how your sequence is arranged, using an adjustment layer may not be the easiest option. Adobe has come up with a really great solution for this called Master Clip Effects. And let me show you how it works. So you're obviously looking at a different project here. And this is another course that I produced recently called The Art of Voice Recording. Unlike the source files you have to work with, this project is made up of the raw camera files, which is why these clips are named 00006.mts. Now, let's imagine that I wanted to apply a color correction to this clip. Let me just back up here in the sequence. You can see in this particular sequence, I'm using this clip right here multiple times. And I have some other clips that I'm using as well, but I'm using this quite a lot. Now, if I wanted to apply, let's say a color correction to this clip right here, I would most likely want to apply it to all of those clips in this sequence, because if I needed to fix something with the coloring or the look of this clip, I would want it to be applied to all of the instances that I'm using this clip in this sequence. Now I could copy and paste the effect to multiple clips, but the problem with that is if I went back and I made an adjustment to one of them, then I would have to delete all of the other effects and then recopy and repaste it over all of these instances of this 00006.mts. That is super, super tedious. Now I could also use an adjustment layer, but at the moment, you can see that I would have to move some layers around and then drop an adjustment layer in here. Now I could do that, but there's a much easier way to do it. And the cool thing about this is it not only affects the clips in this sequence, but it'll affect the clips in any sequence that this master clip is used. Master clips are objects in the project panel other than sequences, multi-camera source sequences, and bins. Examples of master clips include merged clips, subclips, and synthetic clips, such as adjustment layers and color mats. When you apply an effect to a master clip, the effect automatically ripples down to all of the sequence clips created from that master clip. Let's say, for example, I wanted to apply a three-way color corrector to this clip. To apply this effect to the master clip, I can drag this effect from the effects panel here to the project panel where this clip is located. I can drag it to the source monitor up here, or I can drag it to the effects control panel if I'm looking at the master clip. Now, how do I know if I'm looking at the master clip? Well, in order to open the master clip, what you do is select the clip and then you press F on the keyboard. And you'll see that that opens it up in the source monitor here. And now if I jump over to the effects controls, you'll see that there's nothing listed. Now this looks very similar to the normal way you would get clips in the source monitor, which is to just double click on them, but it's a little bit different. If I come to this clip right here and I double click on it, it'll come up in the source monitor here. But if I go over to the effects controls, you'll see all of the default effects that are on this clip. 
because I'm not actually looking at the master clip. And I know that's a little bit confusing, but in order to view the master clip, what I have to do is select the clip and press F. And now you see that the view is a little bit different. And now if I look at the effects controls, I don't see any of those default effects like motion, opacity, time remap, volume, etc. So now to apply this three-way color corrector, I can grab it from the effects panel and drag it right up here. Or if I'm looking at the master clip right here, I can take this effect and drag it right to the source monitor. And you'll see that now it's actually doubled up on here because I did it twice. Let me delete both of these. And the other way is I can drag this effect from the effects panel right to the project panel where this master clip is located. So in order to find it in the project panel, I'm going to right click right here and then choose reveal in project, which is just off the screen. And when I do, I see, hey, it's right here. Now, I'm going to temporarily dock the project panel over here so I can drag the effect to it. But I'm just going to drag this effect right here to 00006.mts. And now if I come back here and I hit F and I go to the effects controls, you'll see that there is a three-way color corrector on this master clip. Now, how do I know it's just on the master clip? Well, if I click on the child clip or the clip that is in a sequence, you'll see that that effect is not applied. So I know that that effect is on the master clip. So let me bring that up again and I'll make an adjustment to it here so you can see exactly what it's going to do. For now, I'm just going to put this back down here where it goes. So I'll do something drastic to this just so you can see what's going on here. Just make this just kind of crazy looking, just jack up the contrast real bad. Well, maybe, maybe not so bad. I'll just give it a very distinct look. Now, even though it looks like it's only applied to this clip right here, if you look, it's applied anytime this clip is used. And again, that effect is not on these individual clips. See, this clip is selected, and in the effects controls panel, you don't see a three way color corrector here. That effect is applied anytime this clip is used in any sequence in your project. Just to show you, I have another sequence here that's using the same clip multiple times. And you can see it's definitely applied to this clip as well. And this is in a completely different sequence. And it's the same exact clip. So master clip effects are a really powerful tool to be able to apply color correction and other effects to clips that you use multiple times throughout your sequence or that you use in multiple sequences. And again, to get to the master clip, you select the clip, then you press F right from the timeline panel here, or you can apply the effects to the clips in the project panel here. And you can apply those master effects to just about anything that's not a sequence, a multicam sequence, or a bin. So I could even apply that to something like a color mat. So let's say I wanted to use a gray mat here for some reason. If I select this gray mat and I hit F, jump over here to the effects controls, you see there's no effects on it. Oftentimes when I use color mats, especially darker color mats, I like to throw a little noise on here. So I'll jump down here and I'll grab a noise. I'll pull that up to the effects controls here on the master clip. And I'll add just a little bit of noise. That's way more noise than I would normally use. But now every time I use this, so I'll come back here to the project panel and I'll pull out another gray mat. Check it out. On this gray mat, I also have noise. And if I look in my sequence here, I'm guessing right here, I have another instance of that. Now I didn't mess with this at all. If I click on this, you'll see that there's actually a noise already applied to this. If I take this noise off though, you'll see that the other noise is applied to this as well. And if I look at this at 100%, you'll see, check that out. There's that nasty, nasty noise that I put onto the master clip. And I can get to that anytime I want just by selecting the clip and pressing F and jumping over to the effects controls. And I can make all of my adjustments right here. This also means that you could set up something like an adjustment layer if you wanted. So I can make an adjustment layer. Let me just set this back to fit here. I'll hit F on the keyboard, jump to the effects controls, 
pull up something like curves, throw a curves on here, and maybe give this just a light amount of contrast. And then I could actually rename this over here to light contrast. And now every time I wanted to add a little bit of contrast to something, I don't even have to apply an effect. I can just grab this light contrast adjustment layer and I just added contrast to that. Check this out. <laughs> All right, that may be a little bit subtle. Let me, uh, let me find somewhere else that may be a little bit more visible. All right, here we go. If I drop this adjustment layer here, boom. Now I have a light contrast adjustment right here. Let me turn that on and off. Check that out. A lot of times I'll be working with my footage and maybe I'll dial in the color. And then after looking at it for a while, I'll say, you know what, that doesn't look quite right. And so if I applied that three-way color correction to individual clips in this sequence, that would be a nightmare to try and fix. Now I have to make the adjustment here and then select all the instances of that clip, remove all of the effects, copy the effect, and then paste it back through all those clips. Way too much work. If I want to make an adjustment, I just press F, I jump over here to the effects controls, and then I make my adjustment. Maybe dial this back a little bit. See what that looks like. Nice, maybe a little bit too much contrast here. Maybe boost up the saturation. That was a little too much. There. And now every time this is used, I have that same exact setup. So Master Clip Effects is a really handy feature to have. In the next lesson, you will learn how to adjust the volume of your tracks so they sound more appropriate for your video. In this lesson, you will learn how to adjust the audio of your tracks so they sound appropriate for your video. In a relatively simple project like this, there's only one audio track that we have to worry about. Now there was audio in all of these cutaway shots here, but I didn't want to include that in this project. I only wanted the audio from these wide shots here because that has Cheryl's microphone on it, and that's what I wanted to work with. So let me start at the beginning here and play this down for a couple of seconds and just listen to the audio. Have you ever had a recipe for chocolate chip cookies that left something to be desired? It can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe. Not flat, not too dry, delicious flavor, picture perfect, and best of all, easy. Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to make big bakery style chocolate chip cookies. So the question comes up, is that loud enough? Now compared to my voice, the volume of those clips is pretty low. And if you saw in the master meters here, if I play back just a portion of that again. Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to make big bakery style chocolate chip cookies. We're getting some peaks that are landing around negative six decibels, and then a lot of the other stuff is around negative 12 decibels, which is, I would say, a little bit on the low side. So let's talk about how to adjust this up just a little bit. Now, as you may have guessed from the audio transitions lesson, we can use these clip volume keyframes here to make volume adjustments. And we'll look at how to do that in just a second. But there's another way that we can kind of globally adjust the volume for all of these clips at the same time. And that's through a process called normalization. What normalization does is essentially take the loudest peak in a given clip and it sets that to a specified level. So for example, if I select this clip right here and I right click on it and I choose audio gain, this will bring up a dialog box with a few options. I can increase the volume here by a set amount. I can normalize the max peak to a specific level. Then I have another option here to normalize all peaks. Now you might think that that would normalize every peak in this particular clip, but this is actually an option that you use when you select multiple clips. So if I wanted to just normalize this clip, I might normalize it to something like negative two. I don't want it to be peaking right at zero decibels, but I want to bring it up quite a bit. And it already shows me that the peak amplitude for this clip is negative 7.1, which means that if I normalize this to negative two, it's going to bring this up about five decibels. And watch what happens to these waveforms when I press OK. They got a lot bigger. So now I'll play this from the beginning, and you notice that it's quite a bit punchier. Have you ever had a recipe for chocolate chip cookies that left something to be desired? It can be daunting trying to find. It's a lot louder, and I think it sounds quite a bit better. I'm going to undo that, 
because I can do that same process to all of these clips. What I'm going to do is select all of these clips and then press G on the keyboard, which is going to bring up that audio gain dialog box. It's the keyboard shortcut. And now it's telling me that the peak amplitude on all of these clips is 3.4 which means that some of these clips are going to be a little bit quieter, some of them are a little bit louder. The loudest one is somewhere in the neighborhood of negative 3.4 decibels. But let's say we wanted to normalize all the peaks, which means the peak in each one of these clips to, let's say, negative 2. You'll see that it looks like everything came up a little bit. Now all of these individual clips have been normalized to a more consistent level. They've all been brought up by various amounts. Let me play a little bit for you. Just the right recipe. Not flat, not too dry, delicious flavor, picture perfect, and best of all, easy. Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to make big bakery style chocolate chip cookies. First, let's go over the ingredients. You will need two cups of all-purpose flour. You can hear that these three clips now sound nice and punchy, and the volume level between them sounds pretty well matched. I am going to switch projects here for just a second because I want to show you that you can adjust the gain of a master clip so that any instances that you pull into a new sequence will have the same gain level adjustment. And to do that, you need to select the master clip in the project panel, and I already have this loaded up here in the source monitor. Let's check out the audio here. I'm just going to zoom all the way out. And if I wanted to adjust the gain or normalize this master clip, I would select the clip right here, and then I could come up to Clip, Audio Options, Audio Gain, or I could use the keyboard shortcut, which is G. That'll bring up the same Audio Gain dialog box here. This clip already has a peak amplitude of zero decibels, so if I try to normalize it to negative two, it's actually going to turn it down. So just for the sake of visualization, I'm going to jack up the gain here by 10 decibels. And you can see what that did right up here to the master clip. So I'll just select a little bit here, and then I'll pull this down here. If you take a look at the audio on this clip, you can see that the audio is much louder because these waveforms are much bigger than all the other instances of this same exact clip that were already in the sequence. So unlike master clip effects, the change that you make with the audio gain to the master clip will not ripple down to all the child clips that you may have in your sequences. However, this is not the end of the world. If you needed to readjust the gain between these clips, we can do that because this audio gain change here is not destructive, meaning any changes you make to clips in Premiere, whether it's a video change or an audio change, do not affect the original clip. It doesn't affect the original source material. So when you normalize this clip, it did not rewrite the audio over the original clip. It's simply making an adjustment inside of Premiere so that the next time you pull this clip in, it has that audio adjustment which means I can go back once this clip is in my sequence and I can select multiple clips, go to audio gain and renormalize all of these clips to something like negative two. And you'll see that change will be updated here. However, if I pull this clip back into the sequence, you can see that it's going to have that same audio gain adjustment that I made previously to the master clip. So if you do need to make an adjustment to your source clips, you probably want to do that before you start pulling them into your sequence. If you see that you have a source clip that has a lower audio level, go ahead and normalize that in the project panel. Then when you start pulling clips into your sequence, they will all have that appropriate volume level. But if you made that change after you already started pulling clips into your sequence, it's not the end of the world. You can go back to this clip here and you can reset the gain back to zero. And now when I pull this clip in, the gain is going to be set right back where it was before I made any adjustment. So there's a lot of flexibility here in normalizing these clips. You could normalize your master source clip over here and then start pulling things into your project. Or if you think it's at an appropriate level, you can just start editing away. And then if you need to make an adjustment later, select your clips, press G on the keyboard, and then make whatever adjustment you need to do. Now, when we got into this CCI ingredients wide shot here, the volume sounded like it dipped down just a little bit. So I might want to come in here and make a more targeted volume adjustment to this clip. So I'm going to zoom up here. And very similar to how I made an adjustment 
with the fade outs or the fade ins of individual clips, I'm going to drop a few keyframes here. Then I'm going to scroll over here and I'm going to take this beginning section here and I'm just going to push that up just a few decibels here. First, let's go over the ingredients. You will need two cups of all purpose flour, half a teaspoon of baking soda, half a teaspoon of kosher salt. And that's a really fast way of making some targeted volume adjustments. If there was a section that Cheryl maybe trailed off a little bit, maybe at the end of a clip. Vanilla extract and two cups of chocolate chips. Maybe I'd like to bring up the part where she says chocolate chips a little bit. I would drop a few keyframes here and maybe just push this up just a hair. Cups of chocolate chips. Now the reason I dropped two keyframes is if I just put one keyframe here and if there was a keyframe after this and a keyframe before this, which there is, if I just pull this up here, the volume is going to increase over this time period here, which is not what I wanted. I'm going to undo that. I use two keyframes and that way I can make a volume adjustment here and then the volume before this first keyframe here remains untouched. So I usually will drop two keyframes when I'm making these adjustments. I'm just going to undo that. So you can use the normalization method and clip volume keyframes to make those adjustments to make sure the audio is at an appropriate level. In the next lesson, you will learn about the basic audio clip effects and audio track effects in Premiere Pro. In this lesson, you will learn about the basic audio clip effects and audio track effects in Premiere Pro. Similar to applying video effects to individual clips, you can also apply audio effects to individual clips. Over here in the effects panel, if you drill down on the audio effects, you'll see there is a range of audio effects at your disposal. And if I wanted to make a little frequency adjustment on one of these clips here, I could do that. I would come over here and I would search for something like EQ and I would bring that in and apply that to this clip. And then over here in the effects controls, I would make some adjustments here. In this case, this effect has a little pop up here. So I would probably do something like apply a little low cut. I would add just a little bit of those high frequencies back because the microphone is located under Cheryl's shirt here. So it's losing some of those really high frequencies. And then I might take a middle frequency somewhere around maybe 370 or 360 Hertz. And I would pull that down a little bit, just a hair. And now check out what this sounds like. Recipe for chocolate chip cookies that left something to be desired. It can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe. And now listen to the difference when it's off. Cookies that left something to be desired. It can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe. I think it makes it sound pretty nice. The problem is, just like with those video effects, what if I wanted this audio effect to apply to multiple clips? Unfortunately, master clip effects do not work with audio. If I hit F here and I bring up the master clip and I try to apply any cue to it, you can't. This is only for video effects. But there's another way and it's very, very easy. And if you come up to window here, come down and select audio track mixer. Now, you may have noticed that there's also an audio clip mixer on here. Let me just pull that over so it's right next door. These mixers do a different thing. The audio clip mixer is essentially another way to make volume adjustments on individual clips. So with this clip selected, you can see that the volume is showing right here at zero decibels. Watch what happens when I hit the home button. Now it's at negative infinity. And if I play this clip, Have you, you can see that this fader here did a little fade up exactly like what these keyframes are doing down here on this clip. Most of the time, I never use this audio clip mixer panel because I prefer to just drop keyframes in here and adjust the volume that way. This other panel here, I use all the time. This represents the volume on the track level, which means instead of making adjustments to individual clips, what I can do is make adjustments to everything on this track, which in audio makes a heck of a lot of sense. 
If I had a project with multiple microphones and multiple people speaking, it would make sense to keep all of those microphones on the same track. So if I had Cheryl speaking, I would keep her on audio track number one. If I had Bob speaking, I would keep him on audio track number two. And the reason is I can apply effects that will be suitable for Cheryl's voice and Bob's voice individually, and it'll apply to the entire track. And to do that, I come over here to the audio track mixer, and there's a little twirl down right here, which is the show hide effects and sends. So I click that, and now I have this sort of effects rack here that I can click and then add effects. So if I wanted to add that EQ here, I'd come down to filter and EQ, and then add that EQ. And now if I double click on it here, I can make those same adjustments. Now, if you want to find out more about why I'm making these particular adjustments, I have an entire course dedicated to audio processing for video, and you can find that on tutsplus.com. For right now, I just want you to understand the process of applying these track effects and clip effects and not be so caught up in the why I'm making these particular adjustments, because that's outside the scope of this course. So with those adjustments made, now if I play this track... Have you ever had a recipe for chocolate chip cookies that left something to be desired? It can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe. It will sound exactly like when I apply this effect and I made these adjustments to this individual clip. But now, this EQ is applied to everything on this track. So if I jump to a later time... ...than the standard 375 degrees, because we're making extra large cookies, so we want to take the low and slow approach. This EQ is applied here as well. So you can use these audio track effects to apply your audio to everything on the track, and that's very, very useful. Typically, what I will do is I'll apply an EQ, and then I'll come down here and I'll grab something like a dynamics processor, and this will help me to just level out the dynamic changes in this track. So it essentially takes the louder stuff and it squishes that back down to a quieter level and then brings everything else up. So it reduces the dynamic range so that it's just a little bit easier to listen to. So I'm going to rewind here and just dial in a few settings. A recipe for chocolate chip cookies that left something to be desired. It can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe. Not flat, not too dry, delicious flavor, picture perfect, and best of all, easy. Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to make big bakery style chocolate chip cookies. First, let's go over the ingredients. You will need two cups of all-purpose flour, half a teaspoon of baking soda, half a teaspoon of kosher salt, three quarters of a cup. So I'd make some adjustments with the compressor until I thought it sounded right. And you may have noticed while I was making those adjustments that these little red lights over here on this meter lit up. These are audio clip indicators, which means that the audio has reached a very bad level. It is either met or exceeded the zero decibel mark. And in digital audio, we can't have anything go past zero decibels because essentially what happens is the waveforms get clipped off or they get squared off and it sounds really nasty. So to prevent this, what I'm going to do is come over here to the master track, which is right here, and I'm going to apply another dynamics processor. I'm going to double click to open it. I'm going to take off the compressor and I'm going to turn on the limiter and turn up the threshold to maybe negative two. And that's it. And now, no matter how loud any track gets in this entire project, the master audio level or the master audio track will never get louder than negative two decibels. All the other tracks are routed to this master channel. You can see that right here. And so it wouldn't matter if I had one track or 10 tracks with audio on them. If I enable this limiter on the master track and I set the threshold to negative two decibels, the audio won't get louder than negative two decibels. I'm just going to click these clip indicators here. And let me show you exactly what that's going to do. I'm going to come back to the dynamics here for this audio track one, and I'm going to crank that all the way up. Now, you'd probably never do this in real life, but just for this demonstration, I want to show you what's going to happen. Then I'll bring up the dynamics processor for the master track here and watch what's going to happen. Of melted butter, one cup of packed brown sugar, half a cup of white sugar, one egg and one egg yolk. 
Essentially, I crank the volume way up on this first track here, and that's almost sure to clip. But when it gets to the master track, it's never going to go louder than negative two decibels. And this is a great insurance policy for your projects to make sure that you're not exporting projects with audio that sounds all nasty and distorted because it's way too loud. In every single one of my projects, I always have a limiter on that master audio track to prevent things from getting too loud and out of hand. I'm just going to jump back here and reset this to a more appropriate level. You will need two cups of all-purpose flour, half a teaspoon of baking soda, half a teaspoon of kosher salt, three quarters of a cup of melted butter, one cup of packed brown sugar. In your audio track mixer, you can apply up to five effects here. And in almost all cases, that's usually plenty. And there are a ton of audio effects in here. There's a few different compressors. There's a few different EQs. There's some other wacky stuff in the modulation. There's some very, very basic and I would say not super useful noise reduction. For some more advanced noise reduction, you want to use a program like Adobe Audition or Isotope RX, but that's going to be a much more advanced process. If I did want to apply a little bit of noise reduction to this, I would probably just put on this denoiser here. Double click to bring it up. Have you ever had a recipe for chocolate chip cookies that left something to be desired? It can be daunting trying to find just the right recipe, not flat. And then just turn down this reduction knob. It actually sounds like it's doing a fairly reasonable job in this particular case, but most of the time I find this to be just a little bit of a crude audio effect and I usually don't go for it. But just like with the video effects, there's a lot of audio effects here that you can experiment with and tweak up your audio and make it sound great. And again, for more information on advanced audio processing, check out my course on advanced audio processing for video available on tutsplus.com. So again, applying effects in this track mixer is very handy. Now this doesn't mean that you'll never apply audio effects to individual clips. A lot of times you'll have maybe a B-roll sound element or you'll have a track with many different audio elements on it. Maybe you have some nature sounds, maybe you have some footsteps or some other sound effects. And in that particular case, it doesn't make sense to put every single one of those on individual tracks. And so in that instance, what you would do is apply those audio effects directly to the clip because you just have one instance of them on your timeline. If you had several instances of kind of natural outside ambient sounds, you may want to put those all on one track and then use these track effects with the audio track mixer to apply EQ and compression and other audio effects to those particular clips. But if you have one or two in your timeline, applying an individual audio effect to that clip is probably the best solution. So now that you have a basic understanding of audio clip effects and audio track effects, you're ready to move on to the next lesson where you're going to learn how to add some basic titles to your video. You will often have to add titles to your video, and in this lesson, you will learn a few ways to get it done. So if I wanted to add a basic title when Cheryl says, Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler, I can do that right inside Premiere. Now I can come up here to the title menu and select new title. Or I can do it right down here in the project panel, which is what I usually do. Now, before I create a title, I'm just going to make a titles bin. And I'll also go ahead and make a mats bin while I'm here. And I'll throw this black video in there. Now, if I click on my titles bin and I choose new item title, the title will be created in my titles bin. So I'm just going to name this here. Always good to name your titles. And then you'll see the title shows up right down here, just like I wanted it to. And it also opens up this titler window here where we can create a title from scratch. Now, if we didn't want to create a title from scratch, we can click right up here and we can load up a template. Now, most of the templates in here are going to be geared towards DVD menus, but there may be a few that you might find usable down here under lower thirds and possibly upper thirds. Let's take a look at the ones in lower thirds. Now I find most of these pretty hokey. I'm just going to press the down arrow on my keyboard to cycle through these. You can modify these so you know you can think of them as a, a place to start. I don't really like the look of any of these though so I usually make titles from scratch but if you did like one of these you can select it 
and open it up in here and then make adjustments however you need. For example, grab the selection tool here, come over here and very carefully try and select the text only. There are multiple layers here. There's a shape layer here, then there's a text layer here. So if I double click, oh, yeah, and sometimes they can be tricky to select. If I double click on the text layer here, maybe change the font to something more simple, Arial, maybe narrow, increase the font size. And I can make an adjustment to this template or I can just start from scratch. So I'm just gonna select all here and just hit delete. So if I wanted to start from scratch, I'd grab the text tool here, type in Cheryl's name, and then position that somewhere around this action safe slash title safe area. Probably change the color to white. And it looks like there's some stroke on here, which I can find down here in the title properties and just get rid of that because I don't particularly like that. You can also add shadow and a whole bunch of other stuff here and really kind of customize the look of your title. For something basic like this, I'd probably just do a white text and then maybe grab this rectangle tool here and draw a rectangle right here and change the color to, I don't know, black. And then I'd like this to be behind the text. So if I right click here, just off the screen, there's an option to arrange and then send to back. There's also a keyboard shortcut, which is control shift begin bracket. And that will send whatever selection you have to the back of the stack. So I wanted this shape layer behind the text and that's how you do it. Then to align these, if I wanted the text to sit right in the center here, I could just draw a selection box around both of these here and then come over here to the align tools and select vertical center and that will align those guys right there. Then maybe select the rectangle here and turn down the opacity just a little bit. I also have other fill types. I could do a linear gradient or I might do a four color gradient and then turn these guys up to maybe 90, 90, and then turn these guys down a little bit, you know, something like that. Let's see what that looks like. So I'll just drag this in. I think she says, hi, my name is Cheryl right here. Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler. And in this video, you can also hear that that denoiser is driving me nuts. Just gonna take that off of my audio track mixer here. Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler, and in this video, I'm going to show you. And I'd probably select this clip and hit Control D so that it adds a nice little crossfade on either side, which will essentially just fade it up and then fade it down, just like we looked at before. Hi, my name is Cheryl Ziegler, and in this video. So that's obviously a very basic looking title. I tend to prefer simple looking titles. If I wanted to make an edit on this, I can double click it right here in the timeline or double click it down here in the project panel. That'll bring the titler window back up. I can turn the video off. Sometimes the video, depending on the color, can make it very difficult to see what you're doing. So there's an option right here to show background video. And there are some styles down here that come loaded by default. Most of these are pretty terrible. Um, you know, we get the, the Western thing. Uh, whatever this thing is and uh, whatever this thing is, you know, some options there. I'm just going to undo those because those are pretty awful. If I wanted to maybe add some texture to this, I could come over here to the title properties. And then right over here, I have an option for texture. And I'll twirl that down. And then if I click in this box here, I'll just navigate to somewhere where I have some textures. Maybe this brown cardboard. It's one of my own textures and load that in here. Now, if I make this a little bit bigger, you can see that the scale of this is a little bit funny. You can see it's, it's kind of squishing the scale. If I twirl down scaling here and alignment, I can kind of fix that. If I set this to texture, then it's just going to, it's not going to rescale the texture as I make this smaller, but you can see the alignment is off here. So if I just adjust this over, that's kind of doing something weird there too. I may have to change this back to clip face and then 
set this to zero. That kind of looks right. To be honest, I personally don't use the titler in Premiere to make fancy looking titles. I usually keep it pretty basic. If I have to make anything kind of intricate looking, I'll do that in After Effects or Photoshop. But it does have some options to make, you know, some fairly nice looking titles. So I might take the texture here, come down to blending and maybe turn this down a little bit and then probably change this to something like brown. Turn the opacity up on that, or maybe just down to like 80. And then just kind of adjust that, you know, maybe I'd add a little shadow here on this text. And then adjust that just a little bit here. Maybe 10 and 30, something like that. Might change the color to like brown. Just to make it punch a little bit. If you created something that you really liked, you could save it as a template. For me, I probably wouldn't go with something like this to save as a template. I would probably take off this texture, change this color to black, and then jump into four color gradient so it sets all the colors to black. Then maybe select this guy here, bump it up to 90, and turn these guys down to maybe like 70, just to give a nice little gradient here. Probably select the text, which can be tricky to do, and then take the shadow off. And then once you have everything set and you think, yeah, I might want to make a template out of this. This looks like something I could use again. Come right up here to the template button. It also has a keyboard shortcut of control J. We can import the current title as a template. And we'll just call this basic lower third. And we have that available right here. Anytime you want to pull that in, then you can change the text name and do whatever you need to do. If I wanted to create another title based on this title, very easy to do. Come up here to title, new title based on current title. That'll ask me to rename it. Bob Smith. And now I have the Bob Smith title open. If I wanted to change this text here, just double click right in the text box. Bob Smith. There you go. Alternatively, you can just duplicate these items and then rename them. And the keyboard shortcut for that is control shift backslash. And that'll duplicate whatever item you have selected. And then I'll just rename this and then double click it to open it. And then I can make my adjustments here. And then I have all these available to use. Now, again, like I mentioned, there are other ways to build titles. You can build one in Photoshop, you can build one in After Effects. The only thing that you need to make sure is that you save it in some kind of file format that saves an alpha channel and that your file actually has an alpha channel, which means that it has transparency. For example, I created some titles here. And if I look at this title, I'll just import it into the project and I'll drag this out here. This is a video title that I created and it has an alpha channel, which means that it has transparency in it. Here's another example of a lower third title that I created in After Effects. It's a nice little animated thing. Apple chip cookies. First, let's go over the ingredients. You will need two cups of all. Obviously that doesn't work for this, but you can see this is a, a little bit more of a complex kind of animation thing here with some, you know, different cool looking shines and, and whatnot. But you can also create titles in Photoshop. Just make sure that they have transparency and you save them to something like PSD or a PNG. JPEG will not work. JPEG does not have an alpha channel, so that's not going to work. But anything that has an alpha channel in it will work if you want to build your titles in another application. So now that you know the basics of creating titles in Premiere, you're ready to go on to the next lesson where you're gonna learn about exporting your project. When you are finished with your project, you will need to export it so that it can be viewed on other devices. In this lesson, you will learn how to use the Adobe Media Encoder to make that process easy. So let's pretend that this project is at a point where we could call it finished. At least it's finished for now. Once you're set and you're happy with the way it looks and sounds, you're ready to export your project. 
Now you may have guessed, just like everything else in Premiere, there are a few ways that you can go about exporting your project. In order to do that, you have to select the thing that you're going to export. If I wanted to export this sequence that we're working on, which is named CCI underscore intro underscore wide, I could do that by making sure my timeline panel is selected. I could make sure my program monitor is selected, or I can come over here and make sure that the sequence is selected in the project panel. Then you could come up here to file, export, and choose media, which also has the keyboard shortcut control M. Then Premiere launches this export settings window here, and you can choose the format and all the individual settings that you wanna to use to export your video. So let's look at exporting to a very popular format, which is H.264 video. This is pretty much the standard for web delivery. It's what Vimeo uses, it's what YouTube uses. So if I come down here under format and I choose H.264, under presets, kind of hard to see, let me just scooch this over. Under presets, there are a bunch of standard presets that you can dial in. So way down here at the bottom, there are some presets for Vimeo. They're just off the screen here. Uh, I'll just select one. I'll choose Vimeo 1080p HD. And when you use a preset, it's going to set a bunch of parameters, which we're going to briefly go over. Right here, we can set the output name and also where you want it to save to. I'm just gonna leave it on the default, but you may want it to encode to a specific location. Export video is selected, export audio is selected. You do have the option to export either one or both. And then it gives you a brief summary of the settings that you have set up here. The output is set to 1920 by 1080 with a square pixel aspect ratio, which is correct. The frame rate is set properly, which is 23.976 frames per second. It is progressive and not interlaced. The duration is one minute, eight seconds, and two frames. And then it has some of the encoding settings here. VBR stands for variable bit rate, one pass. The target megabit rate is 16 megabits per second. The maximum that it will use is 20 megabits per second. That is not megabytes per second. The audio is set to AAC 320 kilobits per second at 48 kilohertz, and it's set to stereo. And then it's giving you a brief summary of the source settings of the material that you are going to be exporting. Now, if you were exporting at a lower resolution or a different format, you would set that up here. You wouldn't necessarily need to edit your whole project in a smaller or lower resolution format. You can set up your sequences for whatever resolution makes the most sense for the source material and then export to a lower resolution. Then down here, you have the individual settings that you can set up. You have your video tab, audio tab, the multiplexer, and then a few other options there that are not quite as important. There's also an effects tab over here, which is not something that you need to worry about right now. Mostly you're gonna be focusing on this video tab and this audio tab right here. And you can see you can dial in all your settings. You have your resolution here, your frame rate, the field order, the aspect ratio. If you want to make sure everything is matched from your source, you can click this match source button and then it will just set everything to the sequence settings. There's an option right here to render at maximum bit depth. This option improves the video's quality but increases how long encoding takes. If you encode the video and you're seeing some banding or you're seeing some weird kind of crunchy looking artifacts. You may want to give it another go and then check this right here. Then you can adjust your overall bit rate, which is essentially the data rate that it's going to use to encode the video. So if you set this really high, you're going to have large files. If you set this really low, you're going to have smaller files. Now for this particular encoder, that's also going to have a direct correlation on the quality of the encode. Although at some point, as you move to the right here, you're not going to see any more quality but your files will still get bigger. So there's a point where there is diminishing returns. There's also a maximum bitrate setting here. If you, for whatever reason, didn't want your video to go above a maximum bitrate, you can set that right here. This is currently set up to the Vimeo standards. There's a keyframe option down here. You're probably not going to need to mess with that too much. There's a couple more options down here. Use maximum render quality. This will give you better scaling, but increases the encoding time. 
if you're not changing the resolution of your video clips in your sequences, meaning you're not taking lower resolution clips and scaling them up, or taking higher resolution clips and scaling them down, you probably don't need to check this. You have the option to use something called frame blending. This creates a smoother motion by blending adjacent frames when the input rate doesn't match your output frame rate. Essentially, this means if you change the speed of any of your videos, this can help create a smoother motion. So because I took that very first cutaway clip and I time stretched that to make it a little bit longer, I could check this and that would smooth that out just a little bit, although it's probably not a huge deal because I didn't do a lot of time stretching there. You have the option to use preview files and this will use the preview files that you generated in Premiere to make things play faster for the final output, which is not something that you want to do for your final deliverable files. This is only something that you may want to use to get a preview in code quality, not a final quality for your videos. And finally, you have the option to import this into your project. If we jump over here to the audio tab, you have some settings that you can adjust over here. The audio format that it's going to use to encode the video, your basic audio settings here, audio codec, sample rate. I'm going to leave these all in their default. The bit rate, which is basically the quality. Right now, it's just off the screen. It's set to 320, which is the maximum that you can get with this particular setting. Over here, there are just a few options. You see currently it's set to the source range, which is the sequence in and out. You can also set this to the entire sequence, which happens to be the same length, or the work area, or you can set it to something custom. You can also click and drag if you wanted to render out a shorter area, or if there is only a particular point in this video that you wanted to render, you could adjust the in point and the out point here. I'm going to set this back to entire sequence. Finally, down here, it shows you the estimated file size. If you're trying to encode to a specific file size, this can be an important number. If you're just looking for the maximum quality, then you're probably not going to pay attention to this number. And not all formats will give you an estimated file size. When you're all set, you have two options. You can choose Q, which will send this over to the Adobe Media Encoder, or you can choose Export. If you choose Export, the video will export immediately and you won't be able to work in Premiere until it's done exporting. So usually the best option is to hit Q and this will send it over to Adobe Media Encoder. When I hit Q, it's going to export the project and then it's going to launch Adobe Media Encoder. And then it gets added right here. Before it starts encoding, you have the option to go back in and change any of those settings that we just went over. If it's good to go, you can just select Start Q right here and it'll start encoding the video. Now there is another way that you can export things from Premiere, and that is by just dragging things from the project panel right into Adobe Media Encoder. For example, I'm just going to slide this over a little bit. I can just grab the sequence right here and drag it right into Adobe Media Encoder and it gets added. Now when it gets added, it may not be set up for the right encoding settings. So you can jump down here and you can set it if we wanted to have this, uh, whoops, okay. It actually just started encoding that there. So I'm just going to delete this and I'm just going to delete this. So let me try that one more time. I'm just going to pull this right into Adobe Media Encoder and it's set to H.264. I can change the preset here if I wanted to. Could also just click right here and then it'll launch this export settings dialog box here. And I can make all of those same adjustments just like I just did. And it'll update here. I can also change where it's going to save. I'm just going to delete this here. You can also grab your whole folder here if you have multiple sequences. And you can pull that inside of Adobe Media Encoder 2. I'm just going to duplicate this with Control Shift Backspace. And then I'll select the sequence folder here. And I'll hit Control M. And you see now the export window looks a little bit different because I'm going to be sending three sequences over. It doesn't give me that preview window here, but it's essentially exactly the same. So if I hit Q, it's going to export those over and they'll all show up right over here in Adobe Media Encoder. 
I'm going to select all those and delete them. Now, the one advantage that dragging things over to Adobe Media Encoder has is you can set up some presets and have your video encode to multiple different presets at the same time. So for example, I have this folder here that says MP4 low quality. Uh, it's a 720 format. You can see here, I'll just slide this over here for a second. If I wanted to take one of my sequences and have it be encoded with two different preset outputs, I could just drag it on this folder and check this out. Now, this one sequence has been added with both of these output formats. So if you have a situation where you need to encode something specifically for, let's say, Vimeo, and then you wanted to encode it for a client's website, they might have different standards. So you can create some presets here in Adobe Media Encoder. Click the new preset button here, dial in your preset. You can name your presets, you can set up preset groups here, and then you can drag things right from Premiere on these folders here, and it will automatically set up both of those outputs. If you're using a particular preset a lot, say you're sending things to Vimeo all the time or sending things to YouTube all the time, you just set up that preset right over here and then you don't even have to go through the export settings dialog box in Premiere. You can just grab your files, pull them right over here into Adobe Media Encoder. You will have to launch the application first, but once you do that, you can just drag things right over here and it'll set up the outputs for you. So now that you understand the basics about exporting your media, you're ready to go on to the last lesson in this course where you're gonna learn some final tips and tricks to make all your editing projects a success. In this lesson, you will get some final tips and tricks for making all your editing projects a success. In this course, we covered a lot of ground and you should be ready to start tackling some video editing projects. However, the skills that you learned in this course are just the beginning. And there's a lot more that Premiere Pro and its sister apps like After Effects, Photoshop, Audition, and Speedgrade have to offer. For video editing, Premiere is the hub, but it will be beneficial for you to be able to use some of those other applications once you get some basic editing experience. And there's a lot more training on these other apps right here on tutsplus.com. Another great resource is the Adobe Premiere Pro help file. The Premiere help file is a 445 page document full of useful information. You don't have to read the entire thing, but it's a great tool for when you don't understand how a specific function or tool works. It will also help you explore areas that I didn't cover in great detail in this course. Something we didn't talk about in this course is acoustic treatment in your space. If you are doing a lot of audio tweaking in your projects and you find that you can't quite dial it in, it could be because your room is not treated. By treated, I don't mean acoustically isolated from the outside sounds, because that's usually extremely expensive to do. Acoustically treating your space means controlling the sound reflections from your ceiling, walls, and floor so that you are hearing a more accurate representation of the sound coming from your speakers. This can make a huge difference in what you are hearing, and for more information on this, you can check out a course called The Art of Voice Recording in which you will learn how to treat your space with acoustic panels. Lastly, I wanted to reiterate the importance of file and project organization. This is something that many people, myself included, have learned the hard way. If I look back at projects that I worked on four or five years ago, they are a little bit of a mess compared to how I organize my projects now. A few times, I've had to go back into those old projects for clients, and it has taken me valuable time to figure out what I was even looking at. A little time at the beginning of the project can save you hours later. Keeping your files and your project assets organized is cheap insurance against potential future problems. I hope the skills you learned in this course will help you to create great looking videos. Again, my name is Dave Bodie for Tuts Plus. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you around.